Oh boy, I didn't start the the didn't start the recording. Now the recording is running. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> uh, Zoom one three three seven. Um, noble six I am. Um, what's the missing twenty percent? Um. Yeah, let's talk about Pareto principle here. Uh, for the first 80%, you need like 20% of the effort. Um, to get uh, the last 20% of uh, quality out of a CFD simulation, you have to put the most effort in it. And yes, if you want to go these last 20%, you will totally rework your simulation. And yes, go for cornering instead of straight line. And... Uh, the mesh might might also change, yes, because it's a not a might not be a straight domain. Uh, turbulence modeling might be the exact same. Okay, thank you for that comment, and I guess I answered that. Yeah, you're welcome. So, I was about to say everything that we have here has like properties, and. Um, that's actually where I work all day. And these properties, uh, um, I'm gonna just uh, explain now. Okay, opacity is like, well, if I go for 0.5, it gets transparent, kind of. Oh, <laughs> and it's gone. Yes, mesh, if you click that, you will see triangulated surfaces right now here, because I have only made a simple geometry, but I don't need that. I can go for the outline. It doesn't have any outlines, cool, and but it has feature lines. And uh, yeah, the surface, well, it's the surface. I could make the elements shrink like that, but to be honest, I have never ever used that feature. And then as a, here we have an option that I do use all the time, and it says uh, the color mode. Um, some people like to go for the uh, for the um, color mode geometry part and then um, change the color of the part itself. Uh, when I do my fancy visualizations, you might have seen on LinkedIn or somewhere somewhere else, uh, I go for preset material and uh, change to some fancy materials. Uh, but you can also use the un the other types. Just er experiment a bit around with that. Um, for geometric setup, I like to go for distinguish inputs. The color changes randomly, and I will tell you later why. Um, if you have any doubts about what we are currently seeing here, there's always the option, if you have that help installed, uh, to click on that button and have a, a PDF or oh, not not a PDF, but uh, uh, some document pop up in your browser, which says, "Okay, I'm going to program files, Siemens, blah blah blah," and there is like a 14,000 pages tutorial and explanation. It's just the whole documentation. You can look literally everything up. Use that button. I beg you. It also has a good search, but. To my students, I normally just say, well, Star System Plus is just like a fluid mechanics and numerics handbook that accidentally fell into code and became executable. Because it's like 14,000 pages, if you printed it, in uh, um, documentation, formulas. There are like 7,000 formulas, there are literature references all over the place. And it's really, really worth a look. And there are tutorials with files and unlimited stuff, really. Okay, stop bragging and advertising about my own software. Uh, let's go on. We switch to distinguish inputs to distinguish inputs. Well, what does that mean? Let's go back to the simulation and take a look. We had that block right here. That block, you can pop up a node. And here we have surfaces. There's a block surface and there's a block curve. What you can do here is, ah, and here's by the way the color that uh, would have been appearing when I switched to geometry part coloring. That color 
or that color which is basically the same right now but you could change it so what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna split the block surface right now and you could go for split by patch and uh, then it will look like that and you can select every patch you would like front back whatever yeah see the patches are also numbered but I'm not doing that right now because I'm a lazy person I will just go for I, I could split non contiguous but it is just it just says here right now part block surface was not split because yeah well it is contiguous Split by part curve, I have never used that. P split by contact, we have no contacts, but I can split it by angle. And the preset here is split it by angles 89 degrees. What happens if you split this geometry by 89 degree angles? Well, you get six independent surfaces. And now we can, we have them all here. And this is why I use the color mode distinguish inputs. See, I have one surface that's blue, that's uh, rose, that's uh, ugly, that's also ugly but different ugly, and gray and uh, ugly again. Okay, cool. Now I can distinguish my inputs and I'm gonna say, yeah, well, let's uh, make them somehow give that child a name so the block I will just call air or better zero underscore air because I just love to number oh it's a double underscore I just love to number everything I do okay you will see later today why numbering makes so much sense so um now give that child a name that's like uh, some surface here well it's it's a bit e uh, it, it, it's a bit unpleasant for me to tell right now where is front where is back where is middle top bottom that can be easily changed if I go to scene plot and say okay I click on the scene and I say okay I need a new coordinate system or I want to see the coordinate systems better to say click on scene coordinate system annotations click on that come on click on that one and I can see oh well I was uh, literally upside down no I was just oriented somehow strange okay cool here we are that's our coordinate system so in that view you will have some helpful shortcuts which is like F for front if you press F on the keyboard it would flip to the front if you go for T it will flip to the top and T again is bottom and T again is top and there is also side uh, with, with an S so clicking on S flips through the sides so yes now I know um, how things are going. I want my car later to travel in the plus x direction. Yeah, that uh, maybe this is uh, this coordinate system might be just in the middle of the car later or something. But I want my car to go in that direction. That means from a CFD standpoint this surface right here is my inlet why is it my inlet well from a CFD standpoint I'm just simulating not the geometry but the air that's flowing around the geometry so I'm literally not moving my car through the air but I'm letting my car move over the air yeah Relative movement is still the same. Doesn't change anything. So I'm gonna call that surface here in the front. I'm gonna call that um, inlet. Um, you can either click right on that 
and say rename. Or what I'm doing is just hitting F2 button and saying 0, 0, no, no, uh, uh, sorry, 0, 8. Why did, did I do 0, 8? I don't know. Doesn't make any sense. Just a second. Ah, okay, let's let's do it. Zero eight, calling it inlet. Okay, we have that inlet now. Well, then if that's the inlet on the far end, the other surface must be the outlet. I'm gonna call that O uh, nine outlet. Okay. So, then this one is easy, should be easy maybe, but we'll treat it later. Um, this one here right in the middle, I just said uh, that the uh, um, that uh, the coordinate system that is shown might be in the center of the car later. Well, yes, in that case, um, we are only simulating half of the car. Because we say our car is ideally symmetric. The there are no outstanding ears outside uh, outside the um, outside uh, the helmet. There are no ears of the of the driver which are unequal, and um, the driver is perfectly equal and uh, symmetric and everything else. That's only valid, and that's like uh, why we are only getting to the 80%. That's only valid if you go in a straight line. If you say you you go a bit sideways or something, or you have a, um, uh, uh, um, if you are tilting a bit to the sides, then your car is no longer symmetric, and that's the limitation of our of that specific model that I'm showing you today. If you wanted to go for beyond these 80%, you should uh, go for a full simulation here, not for a half model. But why am I doing half with the model? Well, because it's only half the size later. And it will be big enough, decently big enough. So this one here in the middle will then be called uh, the 01 Symmetry. Sort of a uh, symmetry phase. Um, 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 um. This one was our inlet, outlet, symmetry. Then, of course, the car stands on a floor, which is 05 floor. And then we have two surfaces left, which I'm gonna combine together. Right click, combine. And see, oh, by that action, uh, Star CCM Plus magically reordered my surfaces, saying now symmetry, floor, inlet, outlet. Okay, and the last one I will call 00, zero far field, because it's most far away from the car, which or the coordinate system right now. So, I could also click on surfaces, right, right click on that and say refresh. And then it's sorted, hey, wonderful. So, now we have these surfaces here. Let's go back to the uh, scene plot for a second. You might have noticed that these views tend to be a little interesting. Yeah, like that. It's, it looks realistic, what I'm doing, because you can look from the side, but it might be a bit unfamiliar to a CAD engineer or a mechanical engineer as I am. And that is because the projection mode, which you can find here in the save, restore, select views or in the views right here, the projection mode is set to perspective. I prefer to say to set it uh, for perspective if I want to make uh, um, so-called photorealistic or high-quality renders. 
But if I want to treat my geometry, I'm just going for parallel view. And then you can see front stays front, whatever you do. Yeah, you can't look to any sides. And side is still side. You don't see any other surfaces. Yeah, it's just a parallel projection. Yes! So I can flip around that and I don't see anything else. That's, uh, from my point of view, it's better from the overall view. What I'm going do, to do now is, I'm going to click on the far field, right click again and say hide, because I don't want to see you right now. Okay, so that's literally, I could call it my virtual wind tunnel. Okay, um, just going to look through the chat for a second. Um, yes, you will get the recorded version of these videos uh, afterwards as well. You can find them on YouTube, Monday, Tuesday, and all the links to it on LinkedIn, I suppose. Um, yeah, under the same name, Meshed Potato. I guess it's Meshed Potato 722 or something, but you will definitely find it. I guess it's also in my bio here on Twitch, um, the links to my YouTube channel, where there's just like one really old video. Okay. What happened when I clicked uh, that surface to hide is uh, this button here became like gray. And if I click now on parts, you can see this one is grayed out and I can say, yes, show it again. Or I can say show only this part. Or I can say restore all parts. Which is tricky if you do it with a full assembly. Because you will hide something at some point uh, that you don't want to see anymore. And uh, then everything comes back. But you can also like double click on surface. And what, tap, what it toggles is part visibility down here. Yeah, See, use part visibility property, hide all parts. So, hiding that one again, right click and hide. I could also say here, show all parts, which is like an override. But I don't use that at all. Just an option. Uh, okay, we have played a lot around with a block long, long, long uh, enough. So, there is something for you of all those users that have been using uh, SimCenter Star CCM Plus before, that is new at that point. Because Siemens, the producer of that software, uh, not only washing machines, but also software, <laughs> had the, um, the habit of storing every single feature that uh, we didn't know where to put, just under tools. Yeah. And you can see, oh boy, what's all in there. There's annotation, color maps, blah, 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 blah. 17,000 options down here. And it was even worse before this release. With the release 2310, so October 23, we had that new automation node. And here we have some crucial functions like parameters, field functions, which we're going to treat uh, very, very at the end. Filters, tags, stages, oh, a cool feature, read it in my blog. <laughs> Update events, timescales, and whatsoever. And we will be treating parameters for now, I guess. Because we will need some more parameters right here. Okay. Just a second. My parameters. The first parameter I'm going to do is a scalar parameter and I'm going to call it uh, zero zero velocity. And I'm just uh, making like a bunch of new parameters, just copying them and pasting. I need a lot of them, so just 
just gonna copy them here yeah should be enough for now so first of all velocity let's do that uh, velocity well has a certain dimension and the di dimension is obviously let's make that menu even bigger the, uh, the perks of full HD screens and better we could go for velocity and do an exponent here see so this is a uh, an exponent and I entered a one and it says well yes velocity dimension and unit meters per second whoop whoop I could also have gone for not velocity but saying length one time oh come on tab doesn't work minus one and it's all again it's uh, meters per second what a big surprise. But I could also say that's going to be some uh, some uh, different uh, units like kilogram times meter per second square, which is Newton. Big surprise. Well, I remembered correctly. Whew. I guess I'm saved now. Proof have proven my competence now so that's like you make up every single unit right here but I'm going for velocity of course because I want my velocity to be a velocity here we go uh, uh, what a volume what did I do now ah yeah you got to read correctly. Velocity, not volume. Meters per second. So um, the so the value that I'm entering here will be sixteen point six 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 seven meters per second, which is round about sixty kilometers per hour. Am I right? Or I could just say, okay, just make it 60 divided by 3 point, important, use a point, 6 here. Yeah, it doesn't work. Does it work? Probably. Let's see data. If that worked. I'm not sure at that point that it understood what I meant. Okay. Next parameter will be the tire sled. Tire sled. The tire sled will be. Ah! Ah, that's an old option. Forget about that. I never used that one. I need to use the. Ah, thank you. No. No, it doesn't say. It says. Now it says it doesn't work. <laughs> I guess I outsmarted your outsmarting here. <laughs> yeah, blocks. Thank you, never, uh, nevertheless. Um, I'm not sure at that point. Might might turn to to the other formulation later. Well, um, I used to have tire sled, so the amount that your tire gets uh, pressed uh, into the ground at some point in my simulations but I guess uh, I didn't use it in my latest simulation so we're not going to use it here but what we still need is a wheel radius wheel radius and the wheel radius is something you can get from your vehicle dynamics department and it will be a length unit and I will call it 235 millimeters because Star CM Plus can translate units. I could also say like 18 inch. Ah, okay, 18 in. Whoop whoop, works. And it cal can calculate with that. But I would never ever advise you to use uh, imperial units in. In your simulation it just uh, messes up everything so um,
let's see. And the next parameter that we are gonna uh, gonna use is something that's called I will name it twenty. Velocity angular wheel because it will be an angular velocity. So I could say angle per sec per time, but I'm just gonna say angular velocity one. And it asks me something in radian per second. I could, of course, switch that to RPM or RPS if I wanted to, but as always, I'm just too. Uh, I'm just not um, clever enough to calculate this, and I'm just uh, saying, okay, take your velocity. And divided by the wheel radius, yeah, at some point I added uh, the tire sled here as well. But that should be it for now. And then I say okay. And it's in. And it even gives me a value. See? In radian per second. And if I go for the velocity, it gives me a value in meters per second. Oh, <laughs> I guess it can't round. Ah, but it works. It works. And this one also. So, first calculation done. Woohoo! The last thing I want to have as a scalar is number 99 because it's the reference frontal area. And this is something you will understand at the end of the business day, hopefully. Um, come on. Okay, I want to sure. I'm sure I want to delete these three items. Um, the reference frontal area. It could, um, when we are later calculating the downforce and the and the um, 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 the downforce and the drag in force, it will always ask us, okay, give us a, a projection area or something. Especially if we want to, if we want to have uh, like a, a, a coefficient of downforce or something. And um, well, for that, it asks you for a reference area to divide it by, literally, just. So you can then get a CD value, like a drag coefficient or something. You always need a reference area for, the, for that, which is normally the projected surface area from the front for cars. For aircraft, it could be the projected area from top, or just the wing surface. Could be anything. Um, there could be an exact value right here. I prefer not to. I will explain later why. And because it is a, a, a um, half model, a symmetrical half model, I will set this to 0.5. So when I divide by that, I will always multiply my values by 2. So getting that uh, symmetry um, into full model back again. So... Uh, it's a surface. It's a surface. It's a surface. No, it gives doesn't give me a, a, a an option to go directly for surface. So I'm just gonna go for, or at least I didn't see it right now. So I'm gonna go for length. Set the exponent to two, and it's square meters right now. Okay. Next parameters we're gonna do are not um, scalar. But they are vector because now it gets interesting. What we are going to do now is we are going to define the wheel center front left, which is number 12 in my counting, and then we are going to define all the other wheel centers. And as you can see, we are doing four wheel centers here which is 
kind of redundant for a half model, but there's still uh, the opportunity. Maybe you want to go for a full model later, and then you already have that one set. So go to your CAD department, uh, uh, torture your suspension guys until you get these values. And uh, I'm just going to copy it from my old file. Ha ha ha. Um, of course, that's all. Uh, that's all uh, dimensions. Uh, as a dimension, that's all um, a position in meters, of course, and it's a vector in three dimensions. So what I'm doing here is I'm with shift, I'm marking them all, and then I'm going for, okay, dimensions, let's say it's the length. And they all have the length right now. So now I'm putting my uh, front left um position in here so that's some position somewhere then i'm renaming the second one to front right i should name it 13 front right ah no is it yeah it's 13 front right then it's 14 wheel center rear left and 15 wheel center rear right okay front left to front right well that just needs a different sign in y um rear left i'm gonna look that value up oh it's basically just like the same with a, a different sign in x so putting the value here see it's like literally the very same and the right side also has a negative y sign so we can't see these parameters right now but that's okay why do we need these well it's kind of simple because we are placing um, new coordinate systems in every single um, tire center just to have an axis uh, where the uh, the uh, uh, wheel is rotating around because we have rotating tires like one third of all CFD simulations that you see in Formula Student don't even have rotating tires or correctly rotating tires we are gonna do this so Cheers to that. Mm -hmm. So how do I make a new coordinate system? Well, it's like the same stuff I told you earlier. If we at Siemens didn't know where to put these things, we just went for tools. Uh, tools, here we go. So here we go. Tools, coordinate system, laboratory, local co coordinate systems, and I'm just gonna say uh, new Cartesian coordinate system. Yeah, I could define it in the scene. For example, if I had a wheel somewhere, I could say, okay, that's one, two, three on the wheel uh, surface, and then it uh, makes a wheel center with that coordinate system. Uh, but I'm just gonna create that one here. Where is it? Where is it? Cartesian one. Okay. I'm gonna call it uh, I guess it was 12 yeah 12 wheel oh, just just call it 12 front left yeah and what I'm gonna do now is just Saying okay, for the origin, choose not the OOO that's uh, up there. I'm just gonna go for this formulation, and it does says dollar dollar. And when it says dollar dollar, you will know it's a vector quantity. If it is a single dollar, like that. That's just a scalar quantity. And if you have something uh, with a tensor, so a three-dimensional 
object, then it's like that, with a triple dollar sign. So I'm just gonna say that, and here we go. Do I need to do something else? Well, yes, I need to do something else, because um, my wheels are not pointing straight. If you want to have like a working um, a working suspension in that system with roll and heave and whatsoever, you could go and parameterize that one in here and say, okay, my vector here will not be that one, but a different one. But that's not what we are gonna do now because. Uh, you will have to work with sinus and cosinus, and potatoes uh, don't know about sinus and cosinus. So I'm going to copy paste just the values from last year, which look like kind of that. Right? So there's like, is it's next to O minus 1, slightly below 0, and it turns. My, basically my z vector up uh, downwards. See that? The z vector is now pointing to the ground of that front left wheel. And the x vector is still pointing in the forward direction and the y vector is pointing in that direction. Okay, cool. So copy pasting this one twice. So what I'm going to do now is uh, take the copy and say, okay, make a 13 of, out of it, uh, 13 front right. I'm just going to say, okay, don't use that coordinate system. Don't use that vector right here. Use the other one, front right. Say, okay. Well, now I have another coordinate system and my first one is gone. Yeah, that's because I don't display them in the scene. So go for the scene and show them all. Just come on. Yeah, here they are. Now uh, maybe maybe I wanna just hide that one so I can see where my coordinate systems are. One is here and one is there. Well, that one I don't like that because I want my tires all to rotate constantly around my y-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, just uh, these values right here. Remove the sign. Uh, no, that sign stays. So it's a bit still a bit inward bound, right? And the y direction is pointing inwards again. So if I have the correct rotation for one tire, I will have that for the second tire as well. So doing that for the other ones as well 14 rear left and 15 15 rear right perfect and changing that of course to rear left and that one to rear right Z. rear right not sure if you can ha hear the sound ping every time that I uh, uh, every time that I uh, uh, click on that. Okay, here we go. Rear left, uh, yeah, you, because you ha always have a different uh, a difference where your wheels are pointing. You, your uh, um, your vehicle department's uh, department will most likely give you some other values or. Yes, in my case, exactly the same values, because my wheels are pointing two degrees inward, I guess. And I'm going to put the, the other wheels just uh, in that here as well. Turning them upside down, and you can see all my Ys from my, wheel, uh, from my wheels are facing inwards. Oof. Yeah, heavy stuff, not really made anything. Um... I would advise you to save your simulation just like right now in a folder that's uh, 
wherever you want to go. And um, I like to give my simulations names, which is, my old team knows that, which is, for example, front wing 280, version 280, rear wing 253, under tray with side ports, no, under tray uh, 211, side ports 404. <laughs> Maybe it, I didn't use any side ports, so I said <laughs> side port 404. Yes, I'm the funny guy. And um, uh, side ports 4 to uh, setup version is the last number. So I'm gonna go for, yeah, let's start easy here, like 000. zero, zero. Making three zeros, a fourth one, and saying yes, that's a f new iteration for this year. I'm uh, starting at the version 500. And if I uh, like that, those four to six, that's like my old numbering. Uh, how many? It's not, I did not do 400 setups, but I started somewhere and then I said yes, that's like. Now I move from the beta to the first real simulation and I'm switching from 49 to uh, version 100 of my setup. And then it advances and I do another stuff and uh, reversions of that. And uh, over the years I got to 426. That's my version number. But like this year we are starting at simulation setup 500. I would advise you to do like that. Never uh, come up with something under scroll changed front wing under scroll final two under scroll uh, converged under scroll issue 67. Come on, you're better than that. Nobody can organize that kind of files. Yes, so we saved that model and it's really, really small, like 35 kilobytes now, but. Um, at least tomorrow it will be like 15 gigabytes or something when it has all solved. Let's see. 15 minutes gone and all we did was a block. So let's start over with the next geometries. Because besides the block for the air we need also something for the inner wheel. And for that we're going to do shape part cylinder right here. Just uh, say okay, create. I could I could like rotate that round here and make something uh, manipulate front coordinate and coordinate or something and say create here or snap it to to any part or whatever I like. I'm just going to say close, come on. What you want. So what I'm what I'm doing right now here is now I'm saying, okay, let's go for O, 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 and the end coordinate O, O, 1. Well, you can just enter that with comma, not dot here, and radius 1. Okay, whatever. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing it. Why am I not seeing it? Yeah, well, because it has no displayer. Just drag and drop it into the scene. And say a new displayer. You can even double click on that. Come on. And enter a displayer name. And I say cylinders. Yeah. New surface displayer. And oh boy. We have cylinders right here. Crazy stuff. See if we have a new. Uh, a new cylinders. Uh, um, displayer here. Just gonna switch to uh, distinguish inputs again because I want that ugly green. Hmm. These cylinders will be related to our front wheel, to our wheel. So I'm gonna call them zero cylinder front left for now. The surfaces need to be split. And I go to the surface node and say split by angle, 89 degrees should be fine, three surfaces. So one is cylinder surface, that's okay, one will, will be out and one will be in. So inside the wheel and outside the wheel. I can't say right now which is which because I don't know where my final cylinder will be. 
Um, but now, like, my cylinder is way too big. I have entered that uh, tire radius of 235 millimeters. Well, the cylinder should be smaller. And based upon my great knowledge, <laughs> we can assume that it is 170 millimeters in radius. Yeah, see, and now it's uh, it's uh, here in the in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the car, basically. What I'm gonna do now is gonna change my um, coordinate system fr to front left. Okay, didn't change anything. So let's go for some coordinates. So I'm gonna go for O, 0 0.08, O. And the other coordinate will be O, Mm, minus point oh six uh six not five oh no ah, that looks like a wheel inner doesn't it so let's see what's inside oh i messed it up of course i messed it up now it's right so cool let's just duplicate that guy right click and uh, in the fourth group there is a duplicate and uh, duplicating the two of them cool and so this will be the front right one what I'm doing now is just I'm going to switch to front right and this one will be rear left and this one will be rear right yeah and now we're not seeing them again so I'm gonna take all of them drag and drop them over and it says yeah some of them are in the cylinders group now I want them all there come on here we go cool so this is uh, rear left and this is rear right but I guess the rear ones had slightly different geometries. So I'm just going to mark them both. And that's just like based on my, on my, uh, how do you call it? Yeah, on my experience. So we are starting at 0.003. Oh, you will have to try that out for your own car geometry, but for mine it works like that. And here it's whoop, it's point six minus point six two. Seventeen point seventeen meters works as well. So that's really really tiny at the rear, but it's okay. I guess it's just uh, the brake disc. Probably, or the. Yeah, we will see later what it is all. Cool. So we have that. We're gonna save that here. Okay. Okay. So what we are going to do right now is we are importing geometries I guess yes we are going for file import surface mesh and yes it's all a surface mesh it's all a surface mesh so what do we have here shall we start with that uh, Zimbody without head I, I think so. Okay. So, what does it want from us right now? Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Okay. Um, it asks us something. Uh, what does it want to, to mark? Sharp cut edges, all edges, whatever. 
uh, sharp edge angle, whatever, whatever, whatever. I normally don't want contacts. And I definitely don't want to have uh, want to open a geometry scene after import. Yeah, let's let's see what happens. Yeah, it's doing something. It it entered a card part right now. And see, watch this. We have some card geometry. Yeah, oh, we can't see it right now, but as always, new surface, put it in, and switch it to uh, distinguish inputs. Ooh, it's just one surface. That's interesting. That's interesting that this is all one surface. Shouldn't be like that. Shouldn't be like that. Ah, oh, maybe, maybe it's okay. But as you can see, that's a detailed CAD model right here with some spring damper system. Uh, no, no uh, uh, connection to the wheels actually. Oh, there's some strange geometry. Ah, team, you need to work on that. <laughs> um, even correctly modeled armpits, they might pose an issue. I don't like that, but uh, we will work with that. There's something strange. <laughs> Maybe it's just my old work because I imported my old uh, stuff. Um, you can see that these spring damper system is actually not completely symmetrical. But to be honest, um, I don't expect uh, major differences just because of that. So let's let's just import uh, uh, the other parts as well. Import surface mesh. What do we have here? Front wing we do have. And these ones are really heavy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, better save than sorry. I know that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just uh, see what else we can import here. Not the DBS file right now. The Zim body can stay where it is. The helmet as a SDL file uh, can stay where it is as well. And um, as you can see, I am here working with uh, JT files, which is X underscore T, which I really like. That's, uh, I guess, is it Parasolid? No, I guess it's a JT file. Or a Parasolid, I'm not sure. But native card parts uh, uh, do also work. Um, I really, really had a, a tough time in the um, in the um, CAD to make all the suspension parts into one. <laughs> Can you share the link to the practice geometry in the description? Well, I guess the geometry is uh, the race car from my old team. I'm not sure if I can share this, but there are plenty of platforms online where you can get free or for a few bucks a full um, model of uh, uh, a Formula student race car. I know that I have searched it and I have found that, so you should uh, maybe stick to that Ashkai, okay? Cool. Um, I will, but nevertheless, I will discuss with my team afterwards. Uh, is there a way to save the workflow? Well, yes, of course. Um, let's say if you just wanted to um, make the uh, same simulation a second time, you will just replace one part or change one part in the simulation. You don't have to start from zero again but what i'm teaching here now is not uh, just here's the finished simulation file i'm going to show you how to ex exchange that and hit the run button no i'm not doing that i'm teaching you how to set it up properly okay 
let's just import that and uh, while it's uh, working we can uh, discuss the other comments oh okay 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 let's see just uh Ah, there's an NX adapter for the parts as well. So, further comments. Hmm? Like I said before, we can exchange the geometry later and just uh, replace part of that and uh, yeah, that's uh, that will all that will all work. Yes. Um, by the way, if you, um, as a Formula student team, become sponsored by Simpson to Star, uh, by by Siemens, you can use that tool uh, sponsored for free with like unlimited cores and whatever you want to. And um, then you can also assess the uh, support center, and there you will find some reference geometries, for example. And um, then you have it. Yes. What else? What else? Uh, okay. We have. We are finished importing. And oh boy, that's a mess. That's a mess right here. And that's why I keep on numbering my my uh, parts. And that's why we are working on this. So I'm gonna grab the first five parts. And just say make a composite. Then we have a composite somewhere, and I will call that composite zero air because all the parts in that are just air parts. Then I'm saying refresh. Come on. Um. Then I'm making a new composite part, which I call zero. Uh, a one car input geometry, and. Under that, I will just place all the parts that are just important, uh, imported, because, um, yeah, well, okay, here we have front wing parts, we're just making these uh, a, a, a another composite, then we have some suspension parts, making this, uh, that's, uh, that becomes heavy directly from the start, making this another composite, well, where, where are we now? Ah, oh, there we have the drive shaft as well. And then we have the rules. Yeah, let's make them, them another. Um. Yeah, make it another complicit. And then we have a rear wing right here. Make it a composite. We have uh, numerous composites right now. Oh, there's a new bodywork in there. <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, I'm just ignoring that for now. Um, then we have that sim body without hat, uh, head and that bodywork. Just making this into a new composite. And we have the drive shaft and here we have the under tray. So, this one was the front wing. Gonna call it 293. Ah, oh, 2. Front wing and it's uh, 293. That's just uh, the variant number. Put it under car input geometry. That's, uh, um, that's the rotating part of the suspension. Yeah, I might need to split that up later. Let's call that... <laughs> 9 Susp rod. That's uh, here, uh, number 9, it's rules. Because that's just some templates from the rule book of Formula Student uh, that represents like a... Okay, that's a go area, that's a no-go area for aerodynamic parts. That's our rear wing, let's call it number three, rear wing, and it's variant number two, five, three in this case. So, putting suspension 
and rear wing also under car input geometry and that's uh, ah that's uh, the body that's body body car input geometry yeah that's also car input geometry and uh, not sure uh, drive shaft not numbering it right now putting it under car geometry and under tray I guess under tray yeah just renaming it um, like 4 UT 211 we could also import it into CAD models yeah that's also possible but as I have a strong CAD background I normally do CAD in a different software and then just import it in here but you can also address like uh, uh, parameters from within here and just change things in here so 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 what next okay drive shaft drive shaft needs to go into the rotating suspension <laughs> Exactly. We are still missing a helmet. That was an F STL file, and I just hell. I just hate STL files, to be honest. Because STL files, they have a final representation already on them, and you can't do anything about that. <laughs> Uh, zoom 1337 yeah you just said that uh, you can't uh, save it as a new one it always overrides yeah you should go for file save as which is also uh, control s sorry I have like the, the German abbreviations in here I don't know why because everything else is uh, English and then I can say, okay, it was, what is it? Um, it was front wing 293, um, rear wing 253, under tray 211, no side pod yet, and uh, yeah, set up 500 it was. Here we go, saved, with all the geometries in it. And we have that, where is my helmet? Where's my helmet? I thought it imported. Can't see it. Okay. And what to do if I can't see a part? Well, drag and drop it over there. Make a new surface. And disable everything you have seen before. And then say, okay, fit. There's my helmet. What's wrong? Oh boy! <laughs> Damn, what happened? Ah, see what I did! <laughs> see what I did? I imported it in, it in the wrong way. Well, that's what happens if you mess around with the units. Yeah, just gonna delete the helmet. I'm sure I want to delete the helmet and then say file import surface mesh helmet and I guess the meters unit was wrong I guess I'm switching to millimeters I don't need that tolerance then because that's like the thousand fold tolerance um, okay and yeah come on Okay, now I see nothing again. I can go there again, and the helmet should be in the same, in the correct place. <laughs> yeah, more or less. In this case, it's less. <laughs> but we can fa fix that issue. We can translate it manually somewhere we want to have it. Going to input geometries. So, um, right. What I'm going to do now is just I'm um, taking all that and putting it all into surface two. 
and as you can see it works beautifully but there's like an offset see there is an offset somebody has played around with the model and we have that double that double bodywork that I don't want to have so gonna cancel that one out um, yes at this part what you got to do is just look at the model and sort the things correctly a bit so we have a misalignment in Y I guess we have a small misalignment in in X because the car needs to go to the front a little bit but the set the Z direction should be fine do we have a small patch here yeah we do cool so what I'm going to do now yeah, that was one big helmet. That's true, Hannes. That's true. <laughs> uh, that uh, might be a little drag issue later. So what we are still missing here is uh, uh, is the the. It's not the uprights. I'm just uh, missing the 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 push rods and pull rods and stuff like that. That's connecting the tires to 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 the to the suspension. Yeah, that seems to be missing still. To be honest, I had my issues when I was working on that card to model them correctly. What I did was I remodeled them in SimCenter Star CCM, just uh, making these little cylinders from the correct diameter and then selecting a uh, start and end point, either from that model or from the kinematic schemes. Okay? This is how I, I made it. Exactly. Mm. For now, we will work with that one. Mm, just thinking about how to proceed from that point. I guess it is time for a 10 minutes break I will just skip where we uh, align these geometries with the position th that it should have and I will just refer to my old file because that has just like all these I these position issues already sorted out uh, makes it a bit easier for all, for all of us and we will start from there in let's say 12 minutes okay cool so thank you everybody see you at 11:40. hi everybody and welcome back um here we are again i have uh, found my old model and opened it up and uh, yeah, we are basically at the same point where we just uh, finished, besides having no scene at all. So, what I'm going to do is um, I will add a new scene for us. What is that? Hmm, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm gonna add a new scene, an empty scene with nothing in it, and just put our air back in, which is literally the same that we had before, and all our car input geometries. New surface, here we go. Um, ah, there was a question you uh, you can uh, comment you can modify the wheel center and update the local coordinate according to the cat geometry reference point right well yes and no yes of course you could go into your parameters right now and say okay i want to have it at another place yeah or just manually reposition it or whatsoever 
but I would go for the um, origin of that issue. Like, where is that mismatch? Did that mismatch happen while exporting the CAD geometry? Are uh, the CAD coordinate system and the CFD coordinate system at the same point? Because we want, there is a one-to-one -one, um, um, correlation between CAD and CFD. So, I export that wing from CAD, I want it at the same position as I imported it into CFD. Yeah? Make sure that these coordinate systems match. Okay? That's what I would do. That's what I would advise you to do. Or, if you can't sort this out, make an automated transform that always repositions it by these few millimeters, for example. Okay? Cool. So, do, 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 do. yeah, here we go again. We have these uh, things here, switching to distinguish inputs again. And we have, hey, magically sorted out that uh, misalignment of helmet and uh, body. And as I spoke of, uh, the, these cylinders are in the correct place, I assume. Yeah, but the the projection mode is should be parallel again. Ah, uh, only issue is we have that outer field again here. Uh, yeah, and we have found the side pod, which is a tiny, tiny flap right over here. We seem to have duplicate faces just right here, because you can see that flickering, I guess. Um, let's see later if that's an issue. We also have these uh, push rod, pull rods, and uh, um, all the rods connecting the wheel hub with the, with the car. Right? And that's uh, everything complete. Um, the rear axle, the rear wheels look correct as well. Yeah, we don't have front suspension up here. That's uh, yeah, that's okay for now. We don't need that. So now you can maybe see why distinguish inputs is is a good representation. If I switch to type, yeah, that's like okay, I can't distinguish anything. So here we can see it again in full detail. So we are at that point. We have that uh, everything sort of the same way I'm just gonna include oh, sorry just gonna include all my coordinate systems again in this model I also had the idea to add a cooling with a cooling fan on the left side and a radiator and a coordinate system for that but uh, we or I actually never never uh, made it that way added it in this race car, the, the cooling system was located on the back, and I thought it would be cool to have an extra radiator coordinate system and a, uh, and a fan that's blowing down behind the, the rear wing. It doesn't play any ro major role for aerodynamics, but could have been additional fidelity at that point. So, yes, we have that front wing. And also, let's see, at that point, I want to stress something that I think can be crucial for your CFD setup. Because every time you model a flap, you typically extrude a profile in CFD. And what happens is you have a very, very pointy edge. A really sharp edge with a small angle like two degrees or maybe five degrees and it's pointing and it finishes in one point and I think that has two issues the first issue is if you want to create a mesh around that point uh, the cells at the very pointy end uh, will be mm, medium good so to say yeah it's okay but it's not optimal so to get it better you don't want to have these sharp edges and the other point is 
that doesn't represent reality. I can't, or my team can't, manufacture an infinitively sharp edge. It gets infinitively uh, sharp at one point and infinitively uh, uh, thin at one point. That's just, uh, yeah, that doesn't work. See? And this is why I finish my profiles with a one millimeter edge. What I normally do is I just select the entire flap when I import it. Sometimes you have to do that, sometimes you don't. And then just say, okay, split by patch, and then I select that one, or just split by edge and say, okay, 80 degrees, and then select that one edge uh, and make it a different edge. And if, I n if you name it edge, it's even better because you can filter by that name later. Okay. You can split that. I have explained how to split that, but uh, it's, it might be necessary, might be not. Here, for the under tray, I have also split it, the sharp edges, as you can see, because I might want to have another mesh refinement at these points later. Okay, but first, let's get this one into a working CFD model. Because what we do have right now is a big of independent geometry. Yeah? And we don't want that. So what I'm gonna do now is I will make so-called um, subtracts. I will start with the um, yeah with the wheels basically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going for operations and I say boolean operation. I want a boolean operation and I say okay that will be a boolean operation. Uh, yes if possible, please do some CAD Boolean operation, which is just, if you work with CAD parts, you have a precise operation. If you work with tessellated parts, you have a tolerance. Okay? That's basically the difference. So that's why I prefer CAD representations. So I'm taking the front left one, and what else? Mm, let's see. Oh yeah, I have renamed the uh, the wheel parts basically just to have it easier. So what I'm uh, now subtracting here is like the wheel. What I could also do is just say, okay, show me everything as a list. And then I just go for front left. Ah, see, it's three parts. Because I have named them all front left and I can just filter by that because I was so clever to name them like that. Yeah, okay. And what's my target part? Well, go for a list because it's just three parts. Okay, the cylinder is my target part because I want to have the air and I'm subtracting the geometry from that. Now I can say, okay, execute it upon generation. Yeah, why not? Come on. Okay. What else I'm doing is I'm linking the output part name and I'm renaming that guy here. And I will call it MRF for moving reference frame. Oh, i just call it front left, why not? And then I have a, a part up here which is also called front left. Okay, just uh, duplicating this one to have four of them, naming them front uh, front right, uh, rear left, oh, come on, rear left, and rear right. So yeah, I know we don't need uh, four of them, but they are like no effort. Yeah, because you can, you will only use like two of them, the ones on the right side. So, 
hello what's wrong so just uh, deselecting everything going for for the list deselecting everything and I'm going for front right yeah that's an issue because front wing contains uh, FR so let's see <laughs> that also works cool yeah best day okay wheel front right I guess I haven't split that one ah wait maybe there are the brakes brake front right oh, okay Okay, target parts. Yeah, must be the cylinder. And then we have. Please, please, please. Uh, ah, stop, 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 stop. We first need to deselect everything because there was something pre selected. Rear left. Okay. And rear right. Oh, can't select them. If they are not filtered, rear right. So, do we have everything right now? No, we don't. Because there is something missing in this in this section, which is. Uh, the suspension rear. We will just need that. And the rear left will also need that suspension. And the front part it's not included. So that one is okay. That one needs to be cylinder. Target part is cylinder. So what we're gonna do now is just click on that cube right here, which says generate volume mesh, but what it basically does is it runs all the operations. Okay. Okay. And it says finished. Cool. Uh, but we still need to talk about tessellation options because tessellation options are critical especially when have dealing with rounded geometries and this is why I mark these tessellation options at once and say okay I want some say, um, user defined hey Okay. Ah, here we go. User defined options. And I want something absolute because I want to have something which is 5e minus 6 meters and 4 degrees. And here we want to have 5 e minus six meters that's just a value that turned out to be good for me and see we get that uh, exclamation mark here again so something is not up to date we can either click on operations and say execute all or we could just execute every one of them saying here execute or we just click on that one and as you can see, it takes a bit longer, tiny little bit longer to to uh, to execute these uh, tessellation oper these subtract and tessellation operations. But after all, this should be fine. Okay, we have done that. To have things in order. I will just add another folder right here 
which I just uh, just another composite part, which is just uh, number three, where I put all the subtracts, I guess. Yeah, why not? So I take these, and just drag and drop them on the subtracts. No execution necessary. Okay. If everything was so easy as that. Hi Chad, I guess I'm back again. Please excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, potato internet. I don't uh, need to explain to you. Everybody who's living in Germany knows these issues. It's not like we are able to sustain a good internet connection at all. Um, yes, thank you for your patience. Let's go on. Um, I was discussing uh, the the stop subtracts right here. The the next subtracts that are we are doing is step by step doing some more subtracts for the for the rest of the geometry. And for that we are first selecting the air and every of these cylinders and let's just yeah, why not just <laughs> select like everything. So the head, sim body. Ah, I wanted to select it all. Yeah, rear wing, side wing, suspension. Is there something I leave out? Yeah, let's let's start with that. And then I say okay. Go for something in the air. And yeah. Then I would uh, save it in advance. Because when I click now on I want to yeah, have a cat boolean for the already described reasons of precision. But if I now say okay, let's see execute this one it says warning yeah can't perform cat paste subtract operations either cat is not available or on all input parts or one of the parts is not closed and manifold Ex uh, for that reason it's executing discrete based uh, boolean, sub boolean subtract operations and I don't want it at that point. That's why I'm first gonna cancel out everything that's definitely not a card part, which is, yeah, what's definitely not a card part, the head is definitely not a card part. Um, okay. Well, side wing is a card part. Uh, yeah, something in the suspension is definitely not a card part. Okay, let's see if it can now do some card subtract. Yeah, looks better maybe. Okay, cool, done. So. Again, I want my tessellation options to be different. Do I? I want my tessellation options, okay, to be different, definitely. And here I found out what does work for me is something like uh, 0.75% and 2 degrees and point 
0.0075% and again 2 degrees. You can find that out uh, by trying and seeing whatever works for you. So let's see what happens now. Yeah, tessellation definitely takes longer. Definitely. Yeah, it's because it just needs to, to make more effort. But yeah, that's that's like ready now. But I'm not sure if uh, that's really how I want it to be because there is something <laughs> no, I'm not using that one because uh, this uh, needs to be executed every time I change something on the wings and there is the body in it that might also trouble a bit no, not the body. The body doesn't trouble us anymore. But what does trouble us is uh, the wings. I want the wings to be excluded from that. Just for the reason that these operations don't have to be executed over and over and over again. When I... Um, when I just uh, uh, replace uh, some wings because I want uh, like this basic subtract to be the same every time and that doesn't change whenever I replace the wings so what I have now is like a, a wingless subtract without a head and it's only medium yes and it's only medium uh, medium precision because it's still a cat part so what does it look like yeah, let's see. Subtract basic, new surface, switching to distinguish inputs. And it's like here, that fat block, hide, and it looks like that. See, it's like half of it, and you can look inside. There it is. Whoop. No wings. Cool. So after that, the next operation I do is another Boolean operation, which is a, another subtract. And that takes the first subtract and all the wings, of course. It's like a philosophy to say, yes, I'm doing that or no, I'm doing not. I don't do that. Oh, we have two front wings here. <gasps> which one? Which one do we take? Which one? Which one? 280. 293, which one? We are going for 280, not 293. Nobody. Hi, everybody. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry for the inconvenience. I hope that's like the last interruption from that side. Let's go on. Um, as I was about to say, um, now we take that basic subtract and add all the wings that we want to have in there. Say, yes, we want to do a cat boolean as well, and now we want to uh, um, do some tessellation objects, so we are not uh, directly executing it. So I'm selecting the first subtract as the target part to uh, select uh, to subtract everything else from there and that's our subtract wings and because that's our last subtract that's going for the user defined uh, precision here we go percent okay 
not executing this right now because yeah because we don't need to because we need a fourth one uh, another one and this one is another subtract and we are gonna subtract the body so taking this one and uh, no not the not the body the head our non cut part and we say yes let's execute this on upon creation and now we wait see now it's uh, still tessellating here the subtract wings and then it will subtract the other one hey subtract wings is really re nearly ready and there is something cool to see because that's what you can see here that's our medium tessellation see how these wheels are really they have like edges and uh, that's not what they will look like when they are finished because um, now I'm putting not that representation here but I'm keep that one in mind but now I'm that's our basic subtract now I'm going to our final subtract and that one will look better I hope is gone and four should be there changing to distinguish imports and hiding the surface and when you zoom in on the wheel now yeah well that's way finer you can hardly see any uh, flat patches and that's all because well that's all because of tessellation that's a different tessellation cool so now we have that. That's a big chunk of our work already. Let's save it at that point. As you can see, our tree in the geometry session gets more and more messy. So I'm just going to put these things over here. Exactly. So. Are we finally done with treating stupid geometry? Can we do some physics? Yes, we can. And for that, we are going into the physics session, uh, into the continuous section. Here, we are going for a new physics continuum. And we just call it, yeah, let's, let's lay, leave it at physics one because we don't need another one. And here we can select models and that's where it gets tricky um, we go for three-dimensional of course we want to simulate a gas but what's also possible could be a liquid a solid gas multi-component uh, liquid solid multi-phase whatever you want to do we are going for a gas so ignore the flow up there let's first go to the time models um, there's little I can tell you about these different models. Um, we will go for steady because that's an approach that is enough for our purpose. The steady model will forcibly lead us to Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes, which is um, nothing different than well the Navier-Stokes equations that describe uh, the connection between velocity pressure and so on all the gas uh, the the fluid properties that uh, solving these uh, um, these equations is literally calculating the flow and as we do that um, we can select 
the steady option and this makes nothing different than basically doing a time derivative and a space derivative of these equations uh, a time averaging and a ta uh, space averaging of these equations so we get a spatial causa solution and a time-wise cause solution we are only calculating averages um, having in mind yeah we are calculating let's say for every small volume we are calculating the average velocity in that volume and how much the actual volume will statistically differ from this average velocity within this volume so we have like a standard deviation kind of of this velocity and of this pressure in that uh, in that cell that's in that small discrete volume but that's like constant over time so naming it steady is okay naming it uh, um, time invariant could be more precise yeah it's not time independent it's time invariant okay that's a big difference so we're going for steady because that's like easier coupled flow segregated flow well basically at a later stage we are solving equations for pressure and velocity and all the quantities and that's like solving a big huge matrix uh, where every line is like a differential equation for uh, a single volume cell the question is do we have separate equations for pressure that we calculate and then solve the equations for velocity so to say that's like figurative what i'm saying it's not like exact uh, or do we put that all together in once and solve it at once that's like coupled when you do it all in once coupled flow can converge faster in our use case meaning deliver a result faster but it will always take more memory because you need to fit more equations into your uh, ram into your memory of your computer that can be an issue but uh, for coupled flow you say you need uh, two gigabytes of ram for every one million cells in this setup sorry <laughs> distracted by dog so we are going for coupled flow and then it asks us what do we expect with the gas is it constant density ideal gas polynomial density real gas uh, something special or something we want to define ourselves well we have quite low velocities here we are not expecting like 300 kilometers per hour or 200 miles per hour flow so the literature tells us um, constant density is enough for our purpose besides that uh, you if you are sponsored by Siemens as a team you can always go to uh, the go to the um, websites to the support center and find documents like the best practice for external aerodynamics and read all the choices that I have done here in this part so I'm gonna say uh, constant density here uh, what kind of viscous regime do we have in viscid uh, which is not friction free but just in viscid laminar and turbulent well we are expecting turbulence here to be honest I'm not hand calculating Reynolds number numbers or anything right here I'm just uh, going for turbulent so uh, choice uh, again what can we say here I have told you about uh, Reynolds averaging our Navier-Stokes equations um, that leads us 
to a to an equation for every volume cell of our domain that we are calculating that contains the velocity the average velocity and the stand the deviation not standard deviation but kind of deviation of that velocity that can be a deviation over time and over space however you like it and same for pressure the thing is we have added now further equations to our overall system thus we can't say that uh, we can calculate a solution to that because we have less equations than we have uh, um, unknown parameters in here. So we have faced something called a closure problem. The equations are no longer closed. More equations than parameters. Uh, more parameters than equations this way around. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And the thing is, there were some clever guys who came up with several ideas how to solve this and invented something that's called turbulent viscosity, which can be seen as kind of a viscosity, but not based on, on like friction between um, 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 layers of fluid so to say but on turbulent phenomena and that's not precisely simulating that's modeling because I'm having like a 1d or zero dimensional uh, equation for that uh, uh, turbulent viscosity that helps me close my, my uh, Navier-Stokes uh, equations again after being Reynolds average and there are several models for that. Uh, Spallard Almaraz was a really really early one which is still used today in avionics in aerospace. Um, K epsilon and K omega are so called two um, equation models because they add two further equations and um, they add two new help, help auxiliary parameters to our equations k and epsilon uh, uh, or k and omega k is the so-called turbulent kinetic energy or tke and it's basically exactly that. Yeah, it's some energy that is thought as based in the turbulence of a flow. Wherever there turbulence begins, it must also be a mech there must also be a mechanism that um, yeah deletes turbulence from the model. And that is called dissipation. The K epsilon model it contains something that is called um, turbulent dis well, sorry <laughs> turbulent dissipation and um, omega contains something that's called um, specific dissipation. And the difference between them is something I'm, I'm not precisely sure at that point you might need to look that up but, but I told you you must doubt what I have to say um, the difference between them is uh, um, dividing this epsilon by the yeah by by kind of a frequency from the swirl from the uh, eddy the the turbulent flow structure like how fast it is rotating and this Dividing the, the dissipation by that number makes the equations more sensible to effects that occur next to the wall. You just you just have to believe that. 
So K omega is more sensitive to capture near wall effects and K omega is more precise to predict flows far away from the surface, from the wall. So what we are basically doing here is uh, taking the K omega and then it also selects everything and we haven't seen anything. Great. Let's revert these changes so I can speak about that. So that was uh, the standard K omega as it was once upon a time. Okay, Jonathan, farewell, Ta have a good time, see you, bye-bye, watch my stream. Yeah, uh, just uh, referring to another comment by uh, Noble6im. Well, Noble, for design runs, I guess there is like nobody using anything else but Reynolds Average Navier Stokes for a CFD simulations in Formula Student. I have seen some detached eddy simulations on... Yes, I have. No large eddy simulation, I guess. But you don't do that for design runs, because in design runs you want to um, quickly, quickly, like in eight hours, get a solution to your simulation. Um, and that's not precise. It's not giving you exact figures. This and that is my downforce value. But it's enough to say concept A is better than concept B. So I can be sure that concept A will be better than concept B in reality as well. Yeah? It's not about the absolute values. It's about the, aver uh, the, the relative figures, so to say. Okay? Wind tunnel validation. Yes, I have seen wind tunnel validations in Formula Student as well, but be careful with that. Wind tunnel visual uh, validations are extremely expensive, and I I swear to you, if you do wind tunnel vi uh, validation and don't learn anything from that, you will get ripped apart in your design review at Formula Student because so many teams would love to have that and I have met one team who did and I learned literally nothing from from their wind tunnel validation they had like CFD numbers which were like 30% below the wind tunnel results and they said yeah well that's turbulence modeling come on let's go yeah they learned nothing from that that's like worse than not doing wind tunnel validation because that's a waste of resources as well and having learned nothing. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, greetings. See you in August. Okay. <laughs> oh, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, you, you should whisper your team to me, but not publicly in the chat. Maybe. <laughs> okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, okay, I was about to say, uh, Standard Wilcox um, K Omega was the, the 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 original one. Oh, you've seen my my room actually. <laughs> Camera just uh, flickered. Um, K Omega was the standard model, and uh, then some clever guy turned that two equation model into something I would personally call a two and a half model, uh, equation model, by putting another factor in it, the shear stress transport, the SST. So what does this do? Yeah, I would bluntly say, yeah, it blends your near wall K omega into a far wall k epsilon so yeah near wall you have k omega and then go far away and have k epsilon you blend over yeah well that's figuratively speaking actually it's really um calculating something called stress transport shear stress transport between these layers 
and then mixing these equations by that. I would call that uh, like two and a half uh, uh, equations because you don't really need to calculate uh, epsilon if you have omega because it's just a constant number in between or a constant uh, flow structure number in between. So that's the difference between these two and then you select it. Oh boy, it's getting into physics again. Um, all wall y plus, high wall y plus, uh, low wall y plus treatment. What's that? Yeah, you can either look it up in, in the literature, attend a lecture, or listen to me in the next 10 minutes. Um, when you have flow, to describe flow, you want to have you will want to find something that you have seen before like saying oh, that flow structure I've seen that in another uh, setup I know how to treat that yeah and this is all about uh, mm, having di dimensionless numbers like Reynolds number okay and another thing is you just um, look at your flow and divide your flow quantities by the free stream velocity. So you normalize your quantities by the free stream velocity. So you get something that is independent of stream velocity and then y plus is literally the wall distance of a cell from wall to the midpoint of the cell divided by the free stream velocity. Uh, I guess I need to find a diagram. Wall y plus diagram. Can we have something? Yes, we can. So here we go, something like this. Yeah. Here on this axis you have like the flow velocity uh, divided by the uh, uh, standard flow velocity, the, the free flow velocity, and here you have that uh, same for the wall distance. And then you have uh, certain flow structures that are always um, um, always constant. So you have um, a viscous sublayer until something to y plus y plus equals three or four. There is yeah, you can you can just like argue. And then there is a buffer layer or a blending region where you don't have that log figure that describes your flow behavior. You have something in between. Yeah, that's uh, that part is critical. And then you have something. I uh, don't. No, 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 no. You don't have uh, uh, the log is here. Sorry. And then you have something that goes logarithmically. That's a logarithmic diagram normally. And um, there you can easily describe the flow as uh, again that's called the log law region. Yeah, you got to you can look this up in the in the um, in a book as if you want to. And then you have an outer layer that's totally different stuff. But what we are focusing is that log law, and here we have something that's linear because these axes are logs actually, and. Um, there's a region in between that we want to avoid. So, when you design a mesh, you try to have your first cell like here. Yeah, so you can describe it with that law. And the other cells here, or some other cells here. Or you say, okay, I'm just skipping all that part. Yeah, all that part will not be resolved. My first cell should be something here, and then you, the computer can say, okay, wonderful, I can directly apply this. Or, starting here, okay, I can directly reapply this. Yeah, that's like the two things I can do. 
in CFD. And that's um, and that's uh, what this is all about. So low wall Y plus is for that uh, low region. High wall Y plus was, was above that buffer layer. And all wall Y plus is taking everything into account. Well, to be honest, don't mess with this. Just go for all wall Y plus because it's also like <laughs> yeah, recommendation indicated by the asterisk. And that's it. Yeah, that's like uh, 3% of the models that uh, SimCenter Star CCM Plus can actually do because you can look at this and whatever, there's more. And you click one but uh, toggle one button and 12 other pop up. Yeah, it's not really just a CFD software, it's a multi physics software. You can estimate from that. Okay, but that's enough. Actually, that's uh, some physics that like everybody in external aerodynamics uh, does use, should use, and will use. Cool. Physics done. Just gonna stop my my recording and start a new one. Okay, are you still with me? Cool. So now. We got to convert this geometry into a finite representation. And for that, we are gonna make a new region. Or we better say something like okay, we have that subject here, and say set new region. And that's air. Okay? Then something pops up under air here okay and then i'm going for rear right and say okay let's set a new region and oops gonna call it rear right region okay and take another one front right and say set region u uh, that's in my, always in the middle of my screen it's never in your view and front right okay now we have these three regions here so in these regions we have boundaries yeah that's like a default boundary. But we will need more. Wait, there's more. We will just add a new boundary. And we will call it 00, zero far field. Because what are we going to do? We are going to put the far field in. See, no matter where it is, you can always find it by searching for it. That's like very cool. And it will be a symmetry plane. Next one is our other symmetry plane. <laughs> I will I will explain why I chose a, a symmetry plane for the far field later. So symmetry plane, here we go. It's a symmetry plane. And then we need a floor. It was 05 floor. Okay. Floor. Here we go. Found it. Now yeah, that's uh, that's like a wall. What more? You. Um. 08 inlet. Come on. Inlet. It will be a velocity inlet. And if you have an inlet, you need an outlet. Okay. 
Come on. Ah, okay, here we go. I was too fast for my computer again. And I'm going for a pressure outlet. There are minor differences between a pressure outlet and an outlet. Don't ask me that. Look it up, please. Okay, you can ask uh, the help file. So, what's next? Uh, yeah, that this one will be my boundary 10. It's a body. And then I need the 20, which is front wing. And I'm gonna search for front wing. Well, looks good. Just selecting all. Ah, nice. Seems to be appropriate. Yep. 30 rear wing. Ah. Rear wing. Looks good. You. 40 UT under tray Now I do have a problem because it's UT211 see that's uh, when you call the parts not good then you have to do it like that and yeah uh, come on New boundary. What else do we need? 50 is side parts. And yes, next is 80 uh, front wheel, a uh, front, front right. And guess what? It's 90, 90 rear right. Yeah, we don't have more of them. So here we are saying wheel. Underscroll. FR, FR. Oh, looks good. And wheel underscore rear right. Yes. Ah, even the drive shaft is in here. That's very good. That's very good. Cool. So we have sorted that out. Um. Yes. Now. We have set the boundary conditions. We need to apply some properties to these because, for example, our inlet has a flow direction specification. Yeah, that's uh, like boundary normal. And a velocity specification. And a velocity magnitude down here in the physics values. I'm just going to put velocity here okay so if I wanted to I could loop through my velocity by addressing a parameter cool very yeah outlet yeah nothing to do there oh floor I already I almost forgot because um, our floor is moving of course so I go for the physics conditions and the tangle tangential velocity specification and say I need a vector and a relative velocity. It is constant and it is constant and it is for those who noticed it's minus velocity because it's a scalar zero zero. So here's our x. It's moving in that direction. 
with velocity and that's like the air is moving and the the ground is moving in the same way that's like no just okay inlet we had that front wing we had that uh, front right wheel this one also needs uh, uh, needs something and it's um, something that we call a local rotation rate you know what's the difference between local rotation rate and rotation rate well rotation rate is around the mid coordinate system yeah the local rotation rate needs a local axis and I'm just gonna say okay wheel front right and it should be the axis O Y O right see that one here just a yeah, I guess you can see it coordinate system here taking that one and see it was worth it to to make that uh, uh, to make that uh, to make that uh, value and then it wants something like a wall relative rotation rate and I say okay we have defined that and that's cool because uh, with that parameter you have to enter that same parameter like four times and if you want it uh, and that's referring to our overall velocity. And if you change it at the velocity, it changes inlet velocity, it changes ground velocity, it changes rotation rate automatically for all four tires. And yeah, that's just by changing one single parameter. Same here. Local rotation rate. We rewrite. Mm, o O pa is alright. It's O one O. Gotta look that up, not that um Yeah, that's true. Physics con no. Where is it? Well relative rotation. Here we go. Delete the zero. Angular velocity. I can even look it up what it is. Yes, nice. Checking my old file. Perfect. <sighs> nice. Very nice. So, yeah, saving that for a second. Then we have two more. Two more of these. <laughs> Here. Okay, two more of the, uh, two more of these, um, which is like the, yeah, the stuff here. And to see that, I'm actually gonna show just what's uh, in there. What do I have here? See, from time to time, you just need to delete what what you have already put there, but no, that's okay. So rear right, front, oh, come on, front right, new display, uh, distinguish inputs. I can even see what's, what's that all about, right? You have some in, out, So, what we are basically now dividing is uh, in our boundaries is uh, um, we are dividing which parts of these are rotating and which parts are not. You could also like uh, set something up um, saying 
Okay, this part, for example, here, the braking disc is hot, and the brake pad is also hot, and our wonderfully 3D printed uh, upright is not hot. Yeah, it's actually a nightmare to get these parts into CFD, but it works. It works. I made it work. Um, yes. Yeah, you could distinguish every surface. This is hot, this is not hot, or something like that. But uh, doing uh, steady cooling simulations is... I would not suggest th this, but if you want to, you can still do it. And it's possible from this setup. So let's distinguish what's rotating and what's not. So first go to front right. And call the... Uh, first boundary rotating because the first boundary that is always there in the in the um, in the region that's like the default boundary and every new parts that that's like nowhere in the in the in the setting ends up in this default so I want it to be in rotating and I need a new one which is stationary yes and let's see what we have here so just this is will be tricky because I don't know what what is maybe this one is the right one no it's not it's part of the rim obviously Maybe this is the right one. No, it's the brake disc. Oh la 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 la. Is there no upright? Hmm. I guess there's something wrong in my subtracts. Let's execute this. Yeah, might be better. Let's put this here. Hide that part. Ah, look! Well, we found some rods, but there's like no There's like no uh, other part for for the wheel. Ah, I guess I can narrow this down. Okay, I will just I will just uh, go from here and uh, put this into put this into steady because now we have like something stationary in here, which is new front right new front right uh, I don't know what A is for but I guess assembly <laughs> uh, that's obviously stationary but our wheel hub is still missing hmm might also be missing in the other parts need to check that later so that's obviously stationary and how we're gonna realizing this um, we are going for the reference frame specification and we're going to say, okay, this is going for a lab reference frame. Um, what's a reference frame? Yeah, it's something like a coordinate system, but it's not a coordinate system. It is like a little bit of coordinate system with a part of physics attached so what do you attach here is like physical properties of movement for example that you could not model otherwise um, I've shown you the the properties of that uh, um, 
of that tangential movement from the front wheel. Why is it called tangential movement? Why can't I just say, okay, rotate around something? It has something to do with uh, how we describe flow. Um, think back to your to some some really really stupid fluid dynamics uh, lectures, like second lecture or something. Um, you had that that diagram when you have a solid wall and you have free stream, yeah, and then you have a curve for the velocity. It looks like that. I should Google it again. Wall flow diagram. It's like the dumbest explanation I can ever think of. Oh, I can't be offline again, can, can I? Okay, I was about to talk about uh, um, something called um, wall flow of the wall next to the wall uh, wall velocity diagram. Uh, I just need to dump single diagram. Okay, that might work. So, here we go. Just uh, think about it as half of that, right? So, you have a standing wall. Just, I'm going to zoom like what we are talking about, that one. So, we have a standing wall and a flow that goes across. And um, that wall is standing, and here we have like free stream velocity. So there is a certain profile in the velocity that just looks like this. I guess, yeah, you have an, uh, analytical formulas for that. I'm not going to talk about that. But that's always the same for a standing ball and a moving flow. But you can turn this thing, the, the things around, like having a moving wall at the top like the diagram on the right now. Okay, you have a standing wall here and a moving wall there and you just have like the opposite flow. Yeah, take it from here. Flow is constant, flow gets accelerated and is very fast at the wall. At the wall itself, it's indefinitely close to the wall. It's the same velocity as the wall. Yeah, that's like sticking to the wall. If the wall had no friction at all, the, the profile would just be constant. Yeah, and there would be no sticking to the wall. Yes, and that's like just one property of the wall. Say, okay, it, it moves like zero compared to the flow, or it moves like 500 compared to the flow. And that's like the parameter, parameter that we're setting here. It would be it totally different thing it, uh, if I said, okay, that wall is moving towards the flow, not tangential, like normal to the flow, like just like applying pressure to that. That's something totally different. That's something we can't just enter with one single number. Okay? Good. Yes. And that's what we are doing with the local rotation, uh, local tangential velocity thing here. Okay? Cool. Easy to understand. But if we want to have normal movement, like between the spokes, that wouldn't be possible. Oh, I just noticed why it is not working. Oh, I don't. Never mind. Um, that's not working for our region. If we had some 
transient or unsteady simulation. So if we select it here in our physics, not that steady button, but just some implicit unsteady, then we could have real rotation and moving our mesh, uh, sorry, moving our mesh step by step by step by step, letting it really rotate. Yeah, we're not doing this here. Instead, what we are doing is we, we are going to say, okay, we have that coordinate system. Let's create our reference frame that moves relative to the other. So we are simulating the region that's stationary in itself. Yeah. But from the outward region, it's moving. Okay. So the flow that gets in there gets swirled through, but f the geometry is stationary in reference to that moving reference frame. So we can simulate that spokes are actually moving and have a normal movement. But from the outside, yeah, it is moving. Okay. How are we going to do this? Okay, we are going down to tools. Here we have tool. We're going to say, right, uh, reference frame new. Then we say, okay, it's uh, front right. Okay? And, well, it's not that hard yet now, actually. Because what we're going to say is the axis direction is O, 1, O. Yeah, we can see that here. That's the axis direction. And we have that rotation. So we're just entering here our velocity and delete the zero. works. We call it uh, uh, front right. And I have some artifacts from, from some earlier simulations. That's none of your business. Just uh, making another one or maybe just copy pasting that one here. Calling it RR and just one click going for RR coordinate system, rear right. That's it. So going back to our regions, we just say, okay, here, yeah, come on. Front right, physics conditions, motion specification, no, it's not. Physics values, ah, motion specification. It is actually stationary. Yeah, we don't have another option because it's steady. But we're going for the front right reference frame. But for the steady stationary boundary. Yeah, we said, yeah, don't use that one. Yeah, use the lab frame, which is that one here. Yeah, this st really, really stationary. <laughs> okay, you got this. I got this. Cool. <laughs> Doing the same for the rear one. Rotary and new boundary. Stationary. Uh, what do we need here? Brake pads, faces, rods. Sounds familiar to me. Yeah, that looks fine. That looks correct. Like the right geometry. Okay. Cool. And, ah, yes, that one needed the reference frame lab. 
and the rear right needed the physics values motion specification rear right okay cool oof really really big of oof at that point um there are a few more changes we need to do in the in our setup because the best practice says so ah it's a, it's a document by my famous colleagues uh, Claudio Santarelli on, and Leon Rekitat. It's uh, this wonderful document. You can find it. Uh, uh, yeah. In here, and um, there are some some things that they want me to change in the physics section here, saying continue. So, couple solver constant density, yes, K omega SST A1 and realizability to 1, 2. Let's go for that. That, that one. Sorry, I need to put that on the side. So, let's go for K omega SST mentor. They said A1, it should be 1. You only need to set this like once. So, yeah. Take this from the handbook and that's it. Clever people have found that out. 1.2. Then, coupled flow, they said. It's no blending. And gradients. I don't find that. Let's see if I can find what they are talking about. Ah, here we have gas. Yeah. Ah, you could also change what, what you are simulating. That's my typical value for, for air density. We could also say, okay, we are in Hockenheim in, in the summer and uh, it's likely going to be very, very hot. I'm turning that down to, I don't know, a one. Yeah, that would also be arguably okay. So, steady, turbulent, where is it? Oh, I can't find that value that I'm searching for. Doesn't matter. Hope, I hope it doesn't matter. Okay. What now? That's all we need to do right here. Next thing up is meshing, I guess. And that's going to be funny. Because we will swap something in between. We are going to mesh our wheels first because it's just, it's just faster. So let's say we are doing an automated mesh here. We do want a surface remesher. We do want an automatic surface repair. Typically, you would, you could directly go for, um, go for um, volume meshes as well. Okay. But please keep in mind um, that surface meshes, they still use one single CPU core. Yeah, it's, it's not so easy to effectively parallelize surface meshes, whereas volume meshing is parallelized. So you use all your CPU cores for that. So what I'm doing is typically I'm creating 
the surface mesh with one CPU core per region and the volume mesh with all CPU cores. Okay? So that's like when you have four wheels and you're making all four of them surface mesh uh, uh, on one core, you have at least four cores working, it's, it only takes like a fourth of the time. Okay, going for that automated mesh. Calling it surf wheel surf mesh. So saying maxi execution measure execution is concurrent. This only works if you go for per part meshing. So you have one part and the other part. Okay. I will talk about what, what I'm doing here because it's not always so easy. Um, this must not this needs not be the perfect setup, but I went for enhanced quality triangle, even though the handbook told me not to, and I increased the mesh quality to the absolute max. Yeah, because I said this part of the simulation that's that's like I'm only meshing it once. Uh, I need to turn my camera a bit. Here I am. So I'm only meshing it like once. Never again. So, make it as good as possible. So the automatic surface repair um, will also be like the best quality that's applicable. Point two, it says below, uh, yeah, maximum quality. Same here. Uh, base size. What the hell? Okay, it seems like I had 40 millimeters of base size here. I'm not sure about that. Just let me open up that other document. Seems kind of big to me. <laughs> okay, it says 10 millimeters, my more or original setup. So, the base size and the target uh, surface size make up the, the the target surface size because the target is always like in percent and then you choose a minimum which is like 20 percent in my case oh, no sorry 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 didn't want to change that i never ever touched the target surface size because i'm controlling that with my with my base size property then i'm going for 20 millimeters here surface curvature I enable this one and say my maximum is 720 points in a circle and I have a 0.05 millimeters curvature deviation. What does that, does that mean? Okay, points per circle. If I may have the full wheel, I don't want it to be in 36 segments because it's a full circle. So it can be maximum 720, like every 0.5 degrees. If the curvature was 0.5 millimeters more away from the mesh, okay. <laughs> Proximity doesn't change anything. Uh, growth rate, I go for a growth rate which is slow. Um, going for a minimum surface area of 0.1 to avoid inner volumes and a surface count of 10,000. Yes. Okay. Good. That's like the basic setups for both of them. What we are still missing, let's see if we got this. No, that's not the one. 
we need some contacts between the air and between the air and uh, um, the regions in here. <laughs> there are several ways to make this happen. Yeah? At the end of the day, all of them all of them come to the same come to the same uh, uh, conclusion. But what we are going to do now is to add them here. Find part part contacts. So I'm gonna add these contacts between our sub sorry not uh, the car input contact between the front right and the subtract. Okay? And it's browsing for contacts now. Searching, 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 finding close parts. Shouldn't go too long. Is it front right? Subtract. Yeah, there sh might be something. Can't say right now. Hope, let's hope. Oh, maybe I should create a part part contact. Not find one. Sorry. Doing that for the other other two. No, didn't work. Yeah, because I can't see it. <laughs> nah. So, sorry to struggle here a bit. There are other options how to create these but to be honest, I don't do this every day. Let's see what this finds for us. Come on. Oh, it might be that we have forgotten something in our big Subtract. <laughs> yes, I've forgotten something in our big subtract. Sorry. Because in our basic subtract, no, oh, it's it's all there. Should be all there. Okay. Okay. What can we can also do is create the cont contacts manually because we know where to find them right so we have this and we're going to search for the same surface in my subtracts so f in f in create weak in place contact here we go. Yes. So we have created the contra contacts right here by just manually searching through these parts. And uh, uh, the Zero wanted to know the differences between these uh, um, these different um, meshing methods in the surface measure. Yeah, let's just refer to them for one second. Um, 
I said uh, the surface measure can create two kinds of different surfaces, which one is triangles. So I'm building triangles everywhere on the geometry and the other one is um, squares. But the squares are not compatible with, with the volume mesh we want to do later. And uh, the enhanced quality triangles are just like better triangles than yeah, what uh, the standard triangles are. Or at least I hope so. I haven't done a A-B testing at that point. If meshing time is really an issue, you should uh, go for a triangle because it's just it's just it will be just faster. Okay, let me do the custom control here. So I'm doing a surface custom control now, right here, for the uh, wheel mesh, right? So I uh, wanted to go for the. Let's call it F in and F out, I guess. And then it's rear in, rin. Okay, don't fi can't find it. Got to search for it manually. Yeah, these two. Okay, these, I call them interfaces, and they will have a specified mesh. Target size will be custom. You can select here, target size is custom, minimum surface size is custom, and surface curvature will be custom, and that's it. Surface curvature, custom, and then I can go into my values and specify them. Because my custom surface size will always be constant, 3 millimeters. And my minimum surface size will also be. Will it be? No, it will, it will be 3% of the base. Not sure if I have made a mistake there. The surface curvature will be like double of what we had before because I think I had some issues here and there. Yes. <coughs> and that's it for the wheel surface mesh. Gonna save it. And yeah, done, I guess. It's concurrent. And we are just gonna mesh it. Mesh it really good. So you can see it's meshing on, it seems to be meshing on two cores. Yeah, I can't t tell right now from the from the task manager. Don't want to brag, so so funny though. You can actually see that it's uh, running on three. Co that it's using three cores. I guess it's one core each for the for the meshing and one core for communication or something. And it has already finished like one of them. So this core is already finished. These two are still working on it. Oh, it shouldn't take too long. Because it's just these small wheels. When we are done with the volume mesh, actually that should be like a 1.5 million cells more or less give or take in every single yes right here we go 
So, what we are doing now is we are setting interfaces, setting one interface here, setting one interface there, just like standard interfaces, nothing special about that. And now we are done with that, um, we can go for the um, volume mesh. But before we turn to that, I want to take a note on operations and the order of these. Because when we do design studies, we will most likely change the wings. Not anything related to the wheels. Right? And that's why I think it is better to have this operation just before the subtract of the of the um, air because that's going to the wheels that's going to the wheels that's wheels that's wheels and that's wheels so let's first finish the wheels and then doing the pipeline as i as we call it for the for the uh, um, yeah, rest of the domain. Yeah, just switching that around by clicking right, saying reorder, drag and drop, here we go. <coughs> we'll do so for the next one, which is... <laughs> which is also for you, Del Cero 17, hope to speak your name correctly, which is another automated mesh. And I will mesh the same, basically. Front right, rear right. I could do this and make the same as I did before. Or I could just copy-paste the old one. So, calling it wheel vol mesh, I guess. And that one will be parallel. Same parts. And then I select other meshes. So the surface meshes go away. <coughs> because we already have that surface mesh. And then I have like three potential meshes here. Um, the first one being a Let's let's start in the middle. The tetrahedral mesh. A tetrahedron is a pyramid with a third, uh, three angle side with a three edged side at the bottom. Tetra. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, here we go. That's a tad. Right here. Here we go, that's a tetrahedral. Then we have the trimmer, which is just um, which is just cubics, exact cubics, all sides equally. The tets don't have equal sides, but the cubes do. <coughs> and then is, there's poly. And poly polyhedral mesh looks something like this. Yeah? It's all made up of something like these. Yeah, that this one looks extremely regular. Some don't. If you cut through it looks like this, for example. But that's just like where you cut it. And these meshes, they are like they have all different strength and weaknesses. Uh, the TED mesh is the simplest one. It can be easily created. But it has like the worst quality. The trimmer mm, is extremely fast to create. I can show you later, it's, it's ridiculously fast. But it has like uh, the 
the advantage or disadvantage that it can only grow in doubling edge size. So you have a small, vo a small, uh, um, a small cube. And if you want to have, uh, you have a big cube, and if, if you want to have a small one, you need to divide every side length by two. So, so in that old one big cube, you can, you must then include like eight new smaller cubes which is a, an edge uh, grow rate of exactly two. With TETs and with polys, you can have any kind of uh, growth factor you want. So you can like grow a little bit from one to another. With, a, with these cubes, the trimmer mesh, you can only grow from big to small every time doubling or eight times the volume. A times volume double the, the the edge length. Yes, that's an advantage. That's also a disadvantage. But the trimmer mesh is called trimmer mesh because you can also cut through, like in every direction through that uh, cube, which makes it so good for for uh, our external aerodynamics, and it's really really fast. But um, the trimmer mesh can uh, is um, mostly used when you have one distinct direction of flow, like you have that straight line car movement. Yeah, well, the the most air is moving in that direction, so having like the mesh oriented in that direction is okay. Yeah, in the wheel you can't say that because the air is swirling around anywhere, so we're going for poly there. General comment on these meshes, a um, TED mesh, every cell has four surfaces, four neighbors. A trimmer mesh, every cell has six neighbors. Yeah, six faces, six neighbors. In a poly mesh, every cell has uh, 10 to 12 neighbors. It depends because the number of edges is not constant. Which means the exchange, think about it as a, a small volumes where your fluid is contained in. If there's a bigger pressure in the neighbor cell, the, the pressure will push via velocity into the next cell. And convergence is reached if no cell wants to push more or less into the others. Okay? Just like continuity. Okay? If you have four neighbors, the exchange of information with your neighbor through the whole grid is slower than if you have six neighbors or even ten, twelve neighbors. So, theoretically, convergence could be faster, maybe even better, in poly meshes. Okay, but there's more to convergence and just uh, what kind of mesh I have created in the first time. Cool. For now, poly meshes are, fa uh, are slower. We are going for poly meshes inside the rims and trimmer mesh in the whole domain. So um, I selected the poly mesh and a prism layer measure in the in the wheels as well. A prism layer mesh is just small prismatic layers from the wall to the so-called core mesh. Okay, you will see that when it's created. So poly measure, yeah, run optimizer, prism layer measure. And here's the first change that I do because I don't want that stretch factor, I want a wall thickness. And uh, this is because I want to say, remember that wall Y plus? I want to control the first boundary cell. And why, how do I control this? Well, um, going for um, some 
free resources again. Just say a CFD minus online com, which is a really, really valuable uh, page going for tools, firewall plus estimator. And I have a free stream velocity of 16.7 meters per second. I have a density of 118 for 15. Boundary layer length, uh, my car is 3 meters long. I desire a wall Y plus value of 1. Yes, Dart R99. Um, I will upload all this uh, to YouTube um, next week. Will be some edits because of my breakdowns, but uh, yes, I will. I will. So here we go. Reynolds number is this and that, and there is an estimated wall distance, and that's just the value that I copy and paste into my into my. Uh, let me let me post that in the chat. Chat, where are you? Yes, chat. Um, yes, that's what I'm taking for wall uh, thickness later. So, popping that up, directly going for prism layer control. Uh, nope. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Prism layer control. I had uh, <laughs> not posting a link here, so I had like this. This was a uh, two e minus five meters or three e minus five meters, which is 0.03 millimeters, which directly goes here. And I want to have six prism layers. Um, let's. When it comes closer to the wall, let's only reduce them to 25%. That's just some value I found out to be nice. Gap fill percentage could be a little bit higher. That's just what I found out. Um, core aspect ratio, we leave that. Minimum, minimum thickness, yeah, going for 5%. Total thickness of our prism layer will be absolute for millimeter. Mm, volume growth rate. Yeah, let's make it a big bit bigger because I want to finish faster. Ted size. Um, yeah, and here we have quality settings. Um, these two numbers should match, but we are have we have a good uh, starting mesh, so I'm going for three optimization cycles and quality threshold of one. Normally you go for eight and one to achieve maximum, but that should be fine. Putting on the hooks here as well. And we forgot the base size, which is 15 millimeters in our case. So, but we still have that interface. Uh, control here. And I want to customize my prism layers. And I want to customize the total number, total thickness and the distribution. So, what do I want to have? I only want to have one prism layer which is three millimeters thick. Remember, I had that surface value of three millimeters. So what I will have in the end, hopefully, is just three meter cells on the whole interface. I just hope. Total thickness, yeah, absolute three millimeter. Did I have absolute three millimeter over there now for? Okay, so that's all set. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure how long it will take to execute this, so we are leaving it at that point. I will, of course, reorder 
what was done before. Yeah, put it just behind the wheel surface mesh. And then we are going to the biggest chair. Uh, the surface mesh and the volume mesh of our big. Ah, the, why is the boundary layer three meters length? Uh, Del Cerro, sorry, I need to find out how to, to enable sounds for the chat, I'm sorry. Um, three meters length, um, I just said, yeah, the whole car. <laughs> okay, that's just like going for any value at that point. Good. Um, so... Let's go for the surface mesh here as well. New mesh, automated mesh, surface mesh. Uh, for the whole subject. That's gonna be tough. Yeah, we need to run that in serial. There is like no other options. And yeah, here we can't afford to go for uh, enhanced quality triangles. We're just uh, doing that like we did before. Doing that like we did before. And we are saying keep the largest areas and uh, minimum face count. So we only have like one surface at the end. Base size. Base size will be 30 millimeters. <coughs> Cat projection, yes. Target, yes. Uh, minimum surface size is 10 millimeters. We don't care. Surface curvature. Uh, yes, I, I told you before that um, I like to split um, the surface and the volume mesh first for the wheels because then I can currently um, mesh front wheels and rear wheels. So one processor core is doing the front wheel, one is the rear wheel, and if I had four wheels, uh, core three and four are also doing some work. Um, doing that on the overall, on the, the, the uh, on the um, full domain is yes probably a bit of redundance but it gives you a bit more control from my perspective that's not like a guideline but from my perspective it gives you a bit more control of what am i setting here which uh, which uh, um, refinement goes where so to say yes Gives you a bit more control at that point. That's why I'm doing that. <laughs> Surface curvature. Yes. 36. 200.1. Hmm. Proximity. Growth rate is default. Minimum, maximum of connected surfaces, one. That's all we need. Minimum surface area, 0.2. And 10,000. <laughs> 10,000 uh, and the custom controls do you know how <laughs> how much this will be okay first custom control this will be the block the you remember that air block yeah that's it so 
subtrack, 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 subtrack. Here we go. It's just the far field and the symmetry plane and the inlet and the outlet exactly these ones so what shall we do well these ones are getting bigger they get uh, custom controls minimum and target surface size and they will get huge they will get a target surface size of 12,800 percent which is yeah the 128 fold of the base size remember that uh, we can only double the so at the edge size in trimmer meshes yeah we can that's like 128 is uh, uh, to power don't know six something five yeah and the same we are doing here we are going for the eightfold as minimum so next one is edges it's edges and for edges remember these wing edges I'm gonna type edge because I named them all edge and I can select them all because they're called edge ah cool look what they are as you might guess these edges will be customized in target surface size and minimum surface size I'm wondering if that's uh, already still necessary but because you can tune that otherwise um, they are going to be at 10% and the minimum will be 1% next one is the floor surface floor the floor will be the floor and it will get bigger because it will just uh, here we have to pay attention it will only get a, a specified target surface size because we uh, want the floor around the car to be quite small but in the far away um, it can be big so we say okay yeah take the standard from the environment and then uh, go for a target surface size of 800 percent okay and then it's interfaces I guess and because I'm a lazy guy I'm just copying the interfaces from here the custom control from above just goes into here yeah okay it didn't work but I hope the values are preserved and I say are out Ah, it was front in and front out and then it was ring now nah, didn't work ah, bye 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 here we go yeah exactly these good interfaces yes we got that then it's tires don't worry it's like two more of them so it's tires and tires will be tires <laughs> very cool very very cool 
card input geometry three. No, no, this one. No, that one. No. Car input geometry suspension wheel tire tire. Why not? And the tires. What did I customize with the tire? Target surface size not. Ah, the the surface curvature needs to be customized because yeah, I want to have the tires round. And they are quite a big geometry, so I'm not losing too much here. 0.05. And as we are in alphabetical order, the next one is uh, the wings. And that's like the last wings. So. No, maybe, maybe we're going for this directly. No, not that one. But if we go for front wing, rear wing, under. Uh -huh. That was easy. Is there something from the body parts as well in here? Just need to check. check. Okay, should be fine like that. Okay, I am confident. Checking the values. Target surface size needs go to go down, of course. And minimum surface size as well. And surface curvature needs to be tuned. So, target surface size will be 25%. And minimum surface size is <laughs> 3.125. Yes, that's vital. <laughs> that is exactly that value. And this one is there to provide that your wing curvature is a wing curvature and not an edge. See? And that's it for the surface mesh. And um, because I am a lazy guy and uh, I don't want to let you wait, I will propose a 20 minutes break at this point um, to let my computer mesh these two parts. First the, the wheel volumetric mesh and then the surface mesh. Um, how do you call it? Surf mesh. Yeah, just like that. And after that, it will be time for our volume mesh, which will be quite fast because it's trimmer. Okay? So, I will just uh, click on mesh right now. Whoa! Some issues. Good that I didn't send you into the break. Yet. So what does it complain about? Um, front right, there are some faces which are not in the assigned to a boundary. Oh boy. Oh boy. What shall I do now? Front right. Just right click and say Set region, front right. Set region, front right. Should be in the region now. And I see I need to rerun that run, that one right now. Well, that's not a problem. So what's stationary? Oh, well, that's rotating. What's stationary? Is there anything? These cylinders will be stationary. Oops, click too fast. Yes. Okay, 
no wheel hub for now. Well, I might fix that later. Okay, that's the point where we save again. And then say... Do we now say, let's go? Do we? Oh, shall we include that? Ah, I guess we need to include that... Uh, that... Uh, front, right, upright, here. And say execute. Yeah, now you can't con can't do this. I know. That's definitely uncool. Let's see what the surface measure will do. But that's like not your problem. Okay. Um. See you at two twenty. Okay, guys and ladies. Hopefully, thank you for your attention. See you in twenty minutes. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, obviously, I just learned that headsets uh, work better when you turn them on. <laughs> Thank you, the sterning. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, welcome back to 2019 pre-pandemic experience uh, right from Germany. Um, okay, sorry to let you wait for 20 minutes. The surface mesh of both the wheels and the full domain and the volume mesh of the wheels themselves took like 11 minutes, which is fair, I guess. So let's see what we got here. Just putting these away. What I'm doing now is um, I'm taking my both my regions, drag and dropping them into here and saying go for a surface. And now I could say, okay, come on here. Distinguish inputs as always. Show me the mesh. And first it gets all blacked out. And then I can see, ooh, there's a wonderful meshed surface. And this is a poly mesh, but I can only see like the first surface of that on the outer side. So let's hide some boundaries oh, okay I, ca I can't uh, click on anything here uh, but what I can do is I can enable a clip clipping planes are just something like these here and if I enable them you can see oops I can move them, then I can cut through these parts and look inside. So I have cut them open, here is stationary, the other, other part around is rotary. Yes, that's uh, what the mesh looks like. Um, but I could also do something called a derived part at that point. Which might be interesting to know how that works and what that is. I'm just gonna say, okay, do me a threshold. And then I say, okay, it gets inputs parts, that's like, uh, okay, takes the regions for whatever reason. And then I say, okay, go for position. Position in y direction. And then I say, I guess it was minus direction that we are into, right? And then I say minus 700. Then I say new display. Come on, create one. Here we go. So, where's my threshold? Here's my threshold. So, 
Maybe I will just ignore the clip for now. Ah, look, there is something. And I just noticed that I have turned the... See, there is something, but I can't really see what it is. So what I'm going to do is I will change the derived parts. Here's my threshold and I'm going to say above max. And yes, it gets turned around. Uh, above max. And 700 might be a bit too much. That's why I'm switching to maybe 600. And here we go. That's actually overriding to see the mesh. That's actually what my poly mesh looks like. See those kind of funny things here. That's my prism layers. See they have these uh, um, hexagonal shape on the surface and they start with a really really tiny cell and then they grow. They like double the size or something or nearly from cell to cell and then they turn over at that point and become those footballs right here. Yeah, that poly cells. Looks a bit chaotic, but that's it. And I could also make like my new first uh, what kind of part contact browser? I'm gonna delete that. Um, I'm gonna do my first uh, um, scalar scene right now, not that one. And say, okay, let's make a scalar out of this. So do a scalar with that. So please, for now, ignore clipping. And I need a scalar function. It asks me to give me a scalar function. So I right click in here and I say prism. Cell height. Ah, cool. I could say prism cell thickness. Or I could say prism cell. Yeah, that's that's something from, from my old team that I really like. Or maybe that. <laughs> kind of interesting what you can do here with the colors. Please do something that's uh, not as ugly as the presets. Okay, that's uh, distinguishing what is prism. Prism is one. And red is not prism. <laughs> And with that you can distinguish, okay, how big is my prism layer? Right? So it starts here. Somewhere with uh, really small. And it goes up to 3 millimeters thickness. And uh, the red one outside, yeah, where well that has a prism layer height of 0. Because it is not a prism layer. Okay? That's how you can see what is prism layer and what is not. <laughs> Actually never done that before. But it's quite interesting to watch and to visualize uh, what is prism layer and what is not. You can take the same look at the front. Ooh. And hopefully we are not having issues here. Because as you can see, the part here is filled with air actually. Do you see that? That is the upright that I had just added. And it seems to be, yeah, not uh, a single part. Maybe it has a leak somewhere. Can I split it? Yes, you can. Maybe, maybe. Nah, that will lead to some 
See, that's what I told you about the the about the part that uh, this 3D printed upright might uh, lead to problems, and told you so it does. So let's turn on off clipping and uh, go back to some classical views of that, because we can now um, volume mesh Ah, okay. Well, if we need to rerun the volume mesh for for this one. And actually, he's telling me that he, he won't you be using all uh, um, um, all uh, uh, processor cores because uh, uh, because well, that's uh, just too much for that small region. Okay, um, we have to go to the volume mesh now for the whole domain. And that's uh, gonna be something new. Come on, get it done. There's nothing less boring. There's nothing more boring than waiting for computers to finish their jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it yeah um, when we are uh, building the volume mesh we will face something that is called uh, refinements we have seen these surface refinements but now we are also sticking to geometry as refinement because it's not only enough to to mesh with surface refinement, but um, you want to capture wake structures like behind wings and stuff. And uh, to get this, you need extra volumes. And then you say to the mesh, okay, please in that volume, make the mesh finder, keep it as fine as it is close to the wing and grow into the big wing later. Hey, and we are finally there. there. Finished interpolation. Okay. Cool. Nice. So I'm saving and then I'm building that that uh, volume mesh. So for that I'm first gonna copy my operation, name it vol mesh, and say please go parallel. That's red for that one. The parts is the part is still correct, but the meshes are not. We want to go trim measure and use a prism layer measure for the trim cells. We want to go. Mm, yeah, we want to run the optimizer. We want to have a size dependent growth rate, and uh, the prism layer measure will most likely be. Uh, wall thickness again because as we had it before um, we want to have a near wall thickness of 0.03 meters we calculated that online and mm, an overall eight layers which should be in enough to capture the boundary layer effects 25 percent reduction here uh, gap fill percentage, percentage as much as possible, which means uh, prism layers can touch, could possibly touch, not really, but yes, possibly. Um, not uh, limiting near core 
layer aspect ratio, but even though I experimented with that, minimum thickness will be 0.1 and boundary march angle will be 71 because that's uh, where the do I have that? Where is it? Need to see my car. Oh, come on. Ah, here we go. So what happens now is um, we don't have that. Uh, ah, we have that car back. Um, we need to switch representations. The representation is a concept that uh, I hardly understand, but uh, I can explain to you. Here you can select what do you want to see. Do you want to see the geometry? Well, that's like most likely when I turn on the meshes. That's like tessellated geometry here and there, right? But I could also say, okay, I don't want to see geometry, I want to see volume mesh. Well, then it disappears because it doesn't have a volume mesh. But maybe there's a surface mesh that I could look at. And that's the surface mesh. Turn it on. And this is what the surface mesh looks like. Beautiful tiny little triangles everywhere. Especially around these uh, round corners, it gets really, really, really tiny. But that's a pretty uh, prerequisite for a good uh, surface mesh, a uh, vo good volume mesh. And that 75 degree angle that I just said for the prism layers, that's going to be crucial for this part, the patch where the tire con contacts the contacts the floor. Because there you have a narrow gap, and I want my prisms to go into there. Critical at that point. Some tutorials say, yeah, just put a one millimeter socket right there. Yes, this will improve. Um, this will improve mesh quality, most likely. Yes, this might improve convergence. But, what is that socket? That socket is standing out of the ground. Yeah, just, just say you have that round tire that is contacting at a one point. I have it overlapped a little bit. So we have that contact patch. You can see that down below. Just showing for a second. Here, that's the contact patch. Yeah, the, the wheel is a bit tilted. That's why it's uh, like that. So, if I had that small socket around that contact patch, that socket, in a steady simulation, can't move with the floor. Yeah, because, I told you, we have um, tangential velocity. That's possible. Tangential velocity with the floor. But that's like something sticking out and it has surfaces normal. It can't move that way. We can't put it into a moving reference frame because we haven't specified it for that. So what shall we do with that? At the end of the day, uh, this will be just like a socket standing out of the ground that the car is currently driving with attached to the wheel that's not rotating, not moving in any way. And that's just unphysical. And the patch, people told me, <laughs> is quite sensitive. Some some cars are quite sensitive to a correctly simulated patch. Because just unlike FEA, a change elsewhere might introduce a, a, a flow change anywhere. That's uh, maybe an issue. So, I'm totally against that socket because I can't explain it from a physical standpoint, only from a, from a mesh generation standpoint. And that's why I avoid it. And that's why I'm not using it. And that's why I try to get my mesh as good as possible at that region with this 75 degree angle. 
Thank you for your attention. <laughs> cool. Say it's at some point a CFD is more like a religion, not a science. I learned machine? Furries? What do you mean? So, um, I'm not sure furries, uh, uh, the learned machine. Are you referring to my dog? Or what? If that's the case, uh, for the next time train, I can, I can, uh, I can get her in the in the view. But uh, no, maybe later. Okay, let's do this. Vima. Nah, she's sleeping. She's not listening to me. That needs to wait. Okay. Getting professionally back to CFD. Where was I? Okay. Um, prism layer control. We have set this. Prism layer total thickness. Um, yes, I set it to 8 millimeters total thickness. Mm -hmm. Oh, we forgot the base size. That's... Oh, no, we didn't. That's 30 millimeters. That's all right. Uh, maximum core transition ratio. We didn't specify. That's okay. Um, volume growth rate, and that's dependent on the base size. So, default shall be very slow, and for small cells it shall be slow. So, normally when you have like a, a, a poly mesh, this is like, okay, the next cell is just like 1.1 in size or 1.2 in base size. So the edges get like 10% bigger, 20% bigger or something. If um, we are talking trimmer meshes, this is more like something, okay, I'm not from when I want to cross like three steps of mesh sizes. Let's say small, medium and big. And as we discussed, the base size for these can only be doubled. So we have like one, two, four. Speaking in volume, we have like one, eight, sixty-four. But if we want to go from fine region to coarse region, then this growth rate determines how many layers do I at least need saying okay you want to go slow okay then please do five layers of medium between small and big so it's not one layer small one layer medium one layer big but it's from the f last small layer there are at least five layers or something just random number here five layers of medium and then big that's what we are determining here okay and so with growth rate growth rate is disabled did we specify the relative cut of size now it's just the 30 millimeters the on the base size as i told you maximum cell size did i specify yes i said it must not be bigger than 16 times the standard base size and of course, we want to optimize all that. So, what happens if we just click on execute without any refinement? I'm not sure what happens, but maybe we can find out. Hopefully. So, okay, using 15 processes so far, J 
just read in the in the thing. So this is like uh, now creating step by step the volume mesh in the trimmer style using all the processors that I have assigned to that uh, simulation at the beginning before you tuned in. And it shouldn't take too long because as I told you compared to the other um, oh well that's maybe not a good idea what I'm doing here right now here. Yeah. Well let's see. Uh, compared to the other mesh types, um, um, this is uh, uh, just this is just the faster and the fastest mesh that you that you can actually build. If the tire overlaps with the ground, how do you account for that? in the ground clearance or do you transform the whole cow with without the sus to compensate the ground clearance well actually if you have a, a car floating around mid-air you have that tire in that perfect round shape yeah that kind of cylindrical balloon balloony stuff whatever here we go it, it took like now one and a half minutes and we have created 15 million cells. Um, just first referring to this, this question and this uh, comment in, in the chat. Um, as soon as you put the car on the ground, the tire will be deformed at the bottom by the weight of the car itself, right? And that's what we are accounting here for with the uh, with the overlap of the street and the tire. Of course, it would be better to have uh, the standing tire like um, 3D scanned and put into a model. Or even better to have it in a running, with a running tire. So you have like the, the tangential forces, uh, the, the um, you know what I mean, the rotational forces uh, widening the tire, which can, could be maybe like neglected at 16 meters per second. Yes, but still, that should be in the CAD model represented correctly how that deformation deforms, uh, uh, how that deformation impacts uh, the right height. Yeah. What's even more critical standing on that point is what happens you have determined your ride height at zero speed but then you increase your speed and you get downforce and your car gets pushed to the ground because your spring damper system gets just like extra load that decreases your uh, your ride height but that's all like uh, referring to aero mapping already doing mm, several CFDs of uh, uh, pitch, yaw, tilt, right height, sensitivity stuff. Okay? I hope that <laughs> somehow answered your question, Liquiz. Cool. Um, just let me know in the chat if you have further questions. So we have converted, if we have uh, done these 15 million cells right now. <laughs> ah, you're welcome. Uh, if you have further questions, just ask, okay? I'm here for that. So, yes. Or you can you can also ask me just uh, these questions on LinkedIn or wherever you want to do. Just comment under the latest post and I will directly see that. That's I'm free to talk. Uh, I wanted to show um, how that looks in, yeah, that's still the surface mesh. And let's switch to the uh, represent whoop, representation volume mesh. 
See, that's what I'm talking about. That is the trimmer mesh. You can see here the small cubes and the bigger cubes. You can even see how these cubes get yeah, intersected whenever you hit geometry. Right? And it looks extremely regular on the floor. But now you have just have this. See, that's like the growth rate. You have several layers of these smaller ones, and then you get bigger and bigger, and then you have uh, go to the end and have like that. Okay? So. Some of you may ask, why do we simulate uh, uh, such a big domain? Isn't that a waste of resources? Well, yes, it is not. Because, uh, well, the overall domain contains 15 million cells, of which 14.6 or something are in that region. Yeah? And that... Uh, uh, that uh, relative number will even change when we go full-blown uh, uh, the mesh later, okay? But that's uh, uh, the reason that the overall the mesh far away from the car that has like 200,000 uh, uh, cells or 400,000 it just does not care and if I made it 10 meters longer it doesn't matter What matters is the geometry close to the car? So, let's see, do we have um, any specifics in the... Ah, I wanted to just to focus uh, for a second what the prism is like. See, that's the prism layer. I need to zoom in so damn wide to see the prism layer. We can even see here on the, on the intersection plane how far I need to go right into there to see the actual prism cells and it's even better on the front wing see <laughs> it's really really small and when you go to the edge yeah you can see that the cells are actually flat they are not like bent or something okay mm. But now we are applying the, these uh, custom controls. So the block, did it have any special? Nope. The edges. They had something special. Because on the edges, I want to customize the prism layers. Number, thickness, distribution. And uh, target surface size is already custom. Yeah, we're not changing this. So what do we do here? It's we are doing 10 layers. That stays the same. So we're adding another two in the same in the same uh, um, space. We're just making two more, which makes them closer together to capture the effects better. Okay, that's just like the region, the reason for that. And yeah, overall thickness is not is not changed at all. I don't know why I, why I uh, uh, did that. Um, floor is basically the same. Oh, with that you can easily switch around uh, from high wall y, from low wall y plus what we are doing here to high wall y plus overall. So um, for the floor we are going from uh, parent to custom again. Number of layer, total thickness, customized distribution, and. Surface size, yeah, it's still the same. Um, surface size. Doo -doo -doo -doo. 
two. Target size, yes. We are going for eight layers on the floor. A bit bigger wall thickness. And a decent chunk bigger overall size, 16 millimeters instead of the the typical the typical three what it was I guess uh, uh, eight what it was. So for the interface, this we are gonna do the same as we did before. I guess it's three three three. Uh, yes, here we go. One prism layer. 3 millimeter and absolute is 3 millimeter should be it did look it up 133 three. oh I'm a genius still remember my own simulation and for the I don't have tires here but I don't care uh, prism layer uh, on the wings, yes, it goes custom. Bam, bam, bam. So it's most likely 10 again and 0.03 and absolute 8 millimeters on the wings. Yes decent. So, um, I have set this for now, but, um, yeah, we have set so many custom controls. What is left in the default control? Well, it's not much, but for example, it's the body. And if I wanted to share the prism layer mesh on the body and saving maybe 5 million cells or something by saying, okay, wall Y plus diagram back into mind. Yeah, I'm not doing that low wall Y plus, but by, by putting really, really tiny prism layer cells on there, I want to skip the first seven and make just one big five millimeter cell on that and have a high wall Y plus approach, then I could just change that value. Nobody should ever, ever, ever do a high wall Y plus on wings. Full stop. No discussion. Sorry. <laughs> okay? Cool. Uh, the uh, exclamation mark lets me know that uh, my measure is not up to date. Yes, who would have thought that? So, to make it up to date, I will just uh, see what I have to do. I will have to put some more um put some more parts in here because uh there are so many refinements that i need to put in here that i have exported them from the other simulation and now i just say come on import where are they cool just uh, importing them all, I guess. No, I don't think I need the offset. And I don't think I need this offset. And there should be a wing offset that I also exported that I don't need. But the other one should be pretty fine I guess. Let's see. Okay. Ooh, okay, thank you. I guess. D 
DBS. Switching that to DBS. Where's DBS? DBS. Have anybody see DBS? I guess I got square eyes already. I can't see DBS. Ah, here, here we go. I just am exporting that one. Yep. Just going for that. Because a PLM XML data is like a look up, up table. What do you all want to import? And see, now it imported everything here at once, right? Yeah, just just everything, and that's like where are we? Yes, great. See, that's my refinement. I guess I chose the wrong unit again. I want to delete it. I want to re-import it. It's that still that uh, helmet that's messing around with us because I set the importing settings to millimeters then. And now it needs to be meters. Sacre bleu. Ah, yes, that looks uh, like more familiar, right? So, well, 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 what do we have here? That's a big refinement. There is another big refinement which starts and goes higher up. And then there's a big refinement going even, going even further up. We have a cylinder. Why on hell on earth I have that cylinder? But, but I guess I found out that uh, I have some swirls going on there that needed to be refined. To be refined. I have some offset of that side plate and suspension okay that one we are not leaving in there we are going to create that anew so how do we create offsets so it's easy just get, go for operations new and say offset and then it's most likely the suspension rear new front right upright and the new upright. Probably. It says up uh, offset right here. Oh, let me just uh, see how many millimeters. I want to have 25 millimeters here. And it's offset. Suspension. Link part name. Yes, I want to rename it. Cool. Then I want to have a wing offset, I guess. And it's also 25 millimeters. So, copying the offset here. Offset wing. And, well, guess what? I'm including all the wings. Uh, we are doing 280 here, so rear wing, side wing. Here we go. Something else. No, that's all right. Mm -hmm. And we have a so-called refinement offset which will be 200 millimeters from the suspension, the front wing. Yeah, literally just uh, the input geometry. Cool. So let's make a another offset of this one here, and 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 this one here. It's easier to choose what not to 
Cool. And this is offset course. Because that will be like a course or offset. And it's 200 millimeters. So let's reorder them. And say, must be before this surf, before the volume mesh at least. Okay. What? Let's see. One, two, three, four. And once this is done, we can make new of a new uh, new refinements in that stuff here. As long as this one is working, sadly though, we can't uh, work on that. But we will later. <laughs> okay, that one is done. Let's go for the wing offset. So, at the last point, we had round about 15 million cells before, before doing the refinements. After doing the refinements, including the remeshed uh, prism layer, we will be somewhere around 15 million cells, probably. Uh, f uh, 35 million cells, not 15 million cells. So more than double the, the mesh count. If you want to run this on your hardware, you should at least, yeah. I don't think that 64 gigabytes of uh, memory will be enough. My recommendation would be like 96 gigabytes of RAM at least, because you need at least two gigabytes of RAM per, per, uh, per million cells. But if you have cluster access, that should be no problem. And for Formula Student teams or any other non-profit organization, there are wonderful support programs by big computing online providers. I'm not making uh, um, any advertisement by giving names, but you can definitely find out. Hey, some of them grant you around about three and a half thousand dollars worth of uh, server time easily set up or comparably easily set up per year so might be worth taking a look here and there yeah just trying to to add extra value into step 19 out of 20 possible. By the way, I would really appreciate your feedback if you want to give me some, either directly here in the chat or via comment or message or whatever you want to do on this platform, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, wherever you can find me. Whoa, offset course was done really, really fast. So let's go. Um, let's make volumetric controls. The first one is called one big 800. Uh, 
Okay. The second one is called 2 wake 50. The next is called 3 offset 25. Next one is called uh, 4 TSAL, a uh, 4, not 5, 4 TSAL 12.5. Then we have 5 wheel ut 12.5 again and 6 sled 3125 3.125 and we need another one which is new uh, da, 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 7 wheel sdr 6.25 the reason why I call it SDR is because I found out that uh, the specific dissipation rate um, residual had issues in a certain region and that was uh, somewhere here around that place. That's why I added the special cylinder. That's how I come up with these names. But basically it's just sorting them 1 to 7 because I like to have an order and that used to be the order of this of their size but apparently something has changed but still the the big ones are the eight ones so going for ref oh <gasps> guys you need to let me know that uh, i have like total chaos in my in my setup so putting the 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 offsets into the refinements again and now I can put, uh, um, see what's in there. Come on. Yep. 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 And uh, putting one, two, three in here. One, two, three. Easy as that. Good. Next is wake 50. And for that, I need a lot of them. Wake 50, which is wake, wake 2, and the wheels stuff. Not these two. Refinement under tray 2, I also put it in there. Here you go. That's it. So that's just like based on on experience because I found out I, I tried to look oh here and there I might need a, another refinement could be nice. Uh, put it in there. Put it in, put it there. Tried it out. Made some sense. Let my residuals fall a little bit more or less. And then I said yeah it's okay it's worth it. So we are at uh, offset twenty five and we have to put in. Refinement offset that one here and wake TKE rear wheel two three and three two <laughs> and ref T cell TSAL one two so TSAL is uh, the the formula student guys of you know that's tractive system active light and back in the times when that sh this model was created, there was some some big lights just uh, around that place somewhere. Okay, that's not even included. <laughs> never mind, never mind. It should be there. Just some light bulb that's uh, flashing flashing through the flashing through the air. Obviously, it's not in my model. I just didn't even notice. But the refinement is still there. Hey, that makes me happy. So if you wanna, and this this gave some decent disturbance to the flow in front of the rear wing, and because it was completely round in shape, that was like really giving 
like common vortex streets and uh, flow separations if you had a transient running and I wanted to capture these effects so I put some refinement there and uh, yeah turns out the tesal is uh, is gone but the refinement is still there so let's go refinements one two and SDR ah seems like I had an issue here as well see this is how, how uh, things grow over time oh boy now now we we go for wheel under tray and that's like a lot so it's offset suspension and you under tray might be a bit redundant what I'm doing here right now oh, wheels guess I have them before and the wing of oh, didn't want to go there that could be really really and the wing offset interesting here we will just have the slats, I hope. So the the contact patches, basically. Yeah, nothing more. And that's like really, really fine because it's 3.15%. Okay. And wheel SDR is our last one. Oh, that's just uh, the SDR one. Refinements. No, oh, it's that one. Not that one. Okay. Are they all enabled? Should they all be enabled? Might be a, re a bit redundant here and there. So let's go through the values. What did I do here? Um, did I custom? I customized the isotropic size here in the big compartment and said, please go to 800. That's finer than the overall uh, thing, right? You know, at the at the far edges, I had something ridiculous like twelve thousand eight hundred percent, and now we are going down to this. Okay, wake control uh, fifty. Quel surprise will be fifty percent, right? Genius. When the numbers speak the value, when the names speak the value. So here we go. Offset 25. I don't even need to look it up. 25. TSAL. Trimmer. Isotropic size. Values. 12.5. We remember it's one eighth. It's again these two four eight and so on so customizing this one 12.5 here as well and the slats the slats are going i don't know if, if that's the correct word 3.125 millimeters no percent 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 not millimeters and the last one will be um, 6.25. Sometimes, um, I guess the, the standard, uh, material, the, the best practice says that you should also go for something over the floor and do some anisotropic. So not, uh, uh some anisotropic, uh, refinement, uh, 
yeah, let's talk about that later. Uh, as soon as I have uh, set up the, the, as soon as I have hit the run button. Yeah, guys, just remember that image that you're seeing right now here. Yeah, it will be different in a minute. Hit that button. Now we have two, three, five minutes time to talk. So um, the best practice says that um, you could, uh, you could, um, you should also make an anisotropic refinement around the floor. Well, maybe the whole floor of the whole domain. And in this case, anisotropic means that you are going away from the cube. You will be more likely meshing in bigger prismatic objects that are rectangular but not cubical. <sighs> you you know what I mean? So you combine m several cubes to one uh, to one to one uh, cell. And that's anisotropic. Basically, <coughs> so it's cuboid actually, <laughs> or a rectangular solid. Thank you. Somebody got some. It's rectangular prism. Wonderful. So that's when you're not native English and you look up a word and it's like completely useless. Thank you for nothing. Okay, cool, 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 cool. How far are we? We are already executing. Yeah. <coughs> Computer might be a bit slower because I never ever did meshing while also having some, some uh, uh, load on the CPU from the OBS and Twitch and whatever goes on in my background. But seems to be working fine. <clears throat> maybe maybe I can talk on hardware just for a second. Um, what you typically see in Windows is not only physical cores, which is 16 on this machine, obviously. Uh, you can also see like logical processes. The difference between them is uh, something called uh, um, simultaneous multi-threading or as uh, Intel calls it, hyperthreading, which is basically switch, uh, putting two threads on one core, making them look like they were two cores. In some application, these fake two cores can be like 40-50% faster than a single core, but for CFD that's not true. It's just because um, you duplicate some of the features in the processor, but not all of them. If you duplicated all of them, yeah, you wouldn't literally have physical cores more. But CFD doesn't exploit that. It's just because uh, the, the <laughs> simulation pipeline just needs these not duplicated resources fully and uh, you would just slow it down. Ah, oh, but we can see we are already Ah, and that's why you see only um, only 15 cores like on full load. These are the actual cores here. The second row always. This one is not going fully because that one is reserved for my other simulation <laughs> that's currently um, popped up because that's like the old stuff that where I'm looking all the numbers up. <laughs> Nobody can remember all of them in the in the brain, or at least I can't. Maybe I could have at a point where I was uh, dealing with this, with this simulation daily. So here we go. Finished interpolation is a good sign. It took another 30 seconds. What a waste. Uh, probably 30 seconds divided by 16 core or 15 cores in that case. The time measures, sometimes they include uh, the CPU count. <gasps> hey, here we go. We have something pointing out from the car. Yes, here we go. Way finer mesh around that structure. No TSAL, though. 
We have fine mesh on the front wing. Now we have 10 prisms even here. And I can say is show you what I mean about that mesh at the edge. Yeah, maybe I can just go to the outside. Yes. That's uh, like the front wing rear edge. And as you can see, he made wonderful uh mesh cells all around that edge yeah it could be could be more 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 or less equal or was something like that but it's he never cancels out the prism layer but if that was like two surfaces going flat together and then ending in a single point he would just like to towards the edge just like take one layer of prisms away then a second one until he reaches the edge where no prism layer at all is. And that will most likely not deliver so much uh, good uh, convergence or good results as I might experience with that simulation. So here's the overall. It's 36 million cells and I guess it took like two minutes or something to mesh. I'm always surprised how fast this can be. Yes. What I will do now is I will show you how the mesh really looks from inside. So, for that we will just uh, put that, what is it? No, not that one. Uh, put, put that one away. <clears throat> and um, make a plane section new and so we go to derived parts and say new uh, section plane 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 section and we say yes go through all of them and as a normal no don't take X for now take Y. Okay, here we go. And you should uh, go to through the like uh, the wheels. Somewhere here the wheels must be or something. Okay. Create a new display. Here we go. Now we can look at the mesh inside. So yeah, here we are close to the rear wing, but not really in the rear wing. Um, here we have these uh, trimmer cells. We have that refinement behind that wheel. And we're going down until there is no more. Um, <coughs> we have some, some sideboard geometry that's sticking out like curved outside here. Don't judge me on the geometry, it's not mine. Um, and yes, here we have that cubical mesh, that trimmer mesh. Here we have a pointy edge that's completely meshed, that's fine. And here in the inner we have that, <coughs> that uh, uh, poly mesh, right. And it looks way more chaotic than it actually is because <sighs> Remember, we have these footballs everywhere, and you just randomly cut through them. And sometimes you're just like at the very edge here, and there's only a tiny bit of football that you cut through. Sometimes you just cut very through the middle of it. Sometimes it even looks as if it was a cube, but it most likely has more or less uh, 10 to 12 edges. 10 to 12 faces. You can even see that we are quite close to the uh, braking disc. That is in the pointed uh, angle in the same way as the tire, obviously. So that's why we are closer at the bottom. There's some geometry here. And here is how we meshed the slat. And that's actually what I'm very proud of. That's not really good mesh, okay? That's not a good mesh, because these cells, they are just very school. 
and some of them might be deleted in the final steps. But for now, they fill the gaps completely and they get with prism layer mesh down to the very pointy end. That was actually hard to achieve. <coughs> and that's, from my point of view, that's better than having the socket, which is just like physically wrong. So let's look to the look at the front wing. Here we have that uh, blunt edge at the rear. And it's going down, standing somewhere in the mint, and here and there. Uh, you could argue that maybe it could have been better if these cells were like smaller than these and not actually bigger. That could be done with that. Uh, there are some 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 uh, mechanisms to lock the aspect ratio of the prism and the core mesh. The the mesh, uh, this trimmer mesh, that's like the core mesh and the boundary near um, cells. That's uh, the prism mesh. So we say core and prism. Okay, right. Yeah, and then of course we have the front wheel, which is poly. Uh, that's basically all. So that's like 95% of my setup at that point. Because I have shown you in the greatest details how exactly physically I set this up, how exactly uh, physically I mesh these things. And all the, there is left is like 722 reports and field functions and whatsoever. <gasps> Besides, something that I did not yet say. <laughs> because when you go for solvers, there is some tricks you need to do with the... Uh, with the... Um, 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 to achieve fastest possible convergence and this is so here we have our solver node which is just below the the interfaces and the regions and the continua and the mesh operations and the geometries and everything here and so here we have the solvers what is it yeah so steady has no properties. Partitioning, yeah, whatever. Wall distance. And then we go coupled implicit. <coughs> That's kind of tricky. Because back in my days, we used to run it something like that. Saving, go for an expert driver. Uh, use an initial CFL of uh, 0.25 and ramp up to 100. Start at 1, ramp end could be 100 or 200. AMG cycles 8, yes. Constant relaxation, we kept it. Um, <laughs> Did we change something here? Yes, yeah, sometimes we used, we change something here in the V cycle. Ah, it's already the preset in this. Cool. But hey, okay, I I have worked on this file before, I guess. Um, it's quite important to have a uh, expert initialization. And that's uh, the big, the big um, thing about the coupled solver because that's not uh, a thing for the for the um, segregated solver. What does this expert initialization do? Okay, let's say we have like 30 to uh, 36 million cells here. For the first time, it calculates. Uh, you can specify maximum 15 causal meshes 
okay? It just makes automatically calculated causal meshes that you can't even see, it doesn't matter, which are like, one is 18 million cells, and then there's one that's 9 million cells, and then there's one that's 4 million cells, 2 million cells, 1 million cells. It goes down to like 6 cells. <laughs> Imagine that. It's just like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's basically just the rough tum tumble. And then it doesn't say, uh, um, it doesn't solve the um, the turbulent equations, but just the inviscid one. Uh, people also call them Euler. You can't hear me? Ah, you can. Oh, you're making my heart explode. Um, this sum up, yes, uh, Hannes is, is right. Um, this is all uh, done locally on my computer. It's nothing, nothing done in the cloud, but that's also possible. Okay, where was I? Uh, solving these equations, um, we have that coarse mesh, and then we solve these. Uh, yeah, turbulence-free equations, uh, inviscid equations, called Euler equations, and with that we become, uh, we we get something that could be at least correct for yeah, let's say continuity of flow or some idea of momentum that's flowing through there. Yeah, and um, with that we. Um, we can first s solve these six iterations, and that's done in a split second. <laughs> you won't even notice. And then it goes to 12, and then it doubles, and then it doubles, and then it doubles. So we're, every time we're taking the coarser solution and put it in onto a, a finer mesh, then we're running it again. And this is just to initialize, to start with a good estimation. So at the beginning, I already have something that's okay, and then I start and calculate over. That makes my convergence in my first iterations, in my first 50 iterations of something, go very, very fast. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, something really important about the the coupled solver right here. What else did I? Do here, I guess nothing, but I guess I have played around with every single step. Okay, in this thing, one more thing. If you want to take a look what's going wrong in your simulation, yeah, a uh, death stroke. 1610. Yes, you can rewatch this stream. I'm not sure if it's recorded on Twitch, but I'm recording it locally. So we'll, I will reshare it on YouTube uh, next week. Don't hit me if it's uh, Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, might take some time because uh, I have to cut out here and there. Yes. We'll cut out the, the parts where it was offline, literally. <laughs> okay, and um, yes, you can rewatch it then. Oh, please don't call me, sir. Nobody does. So, greetings uh, to your time zone. Have a good night, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, where, where, where was I? I was uh, talking about uh, troubleshooting. Troubleshooting, um, if you want, say, if you have a residual that's not falling down. Residual is like a numerical estimation of uh, the r the leftover error in your simulation. And if they are falling, we sometimes call that conversions, even if it's not completely true. And uh, if they're not falling, we look at our... Um, um, residuals and say, well, that's something wrong with turbulence, and then 
I would advise you sometimes to do something like that and mark that temporary storage retain here for coupled implicit and turbulence. I guess it's only these two. And then do one iteration. Then you get more field functions like uh, the residual in the actual cells, but at the expense of extra memory. So be careful. Okay? Good, 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 good. What else can we do now? What else can we do now? Ah, yeah, we can, we can uh, come to the very, very... We could come to the uh, reports and field file, uh, reports and stuff. Oh boy, that's, that's like, like a big, big, big bunch of field functions. <laughs> um, I think it would be easier if we just switched to the other simulation that actually has a solution in it. Just give me a second. Yes, I guess we are taking a five minutes break at that point. So I will see you guys back at quarter to four, my time. And I will just pop up the other simulation that has already been solved. And we will take a look on what you would typically look at for field for, uh, for, per, for uh, results. Yeah and work on that further okay cool see you in five minutes then um twitch doesn't have my stream stored uh yeah i but i do locally uh store my streams so i will upload them to youtube later uh the reference geometry i will need to talk to my team my old team it does have it Ah, sorry, sorry, I, I got you wrong. I guess I, I guess I had the death stroke right here. <laughs> okay, um, so it does have it. That's great, but uh, double content for the same price is uh, kind of nice. Yeah. Um, where was I? Okay, we have solved this uh, simulation. What did we see all the time? Well, we saw something like this. As called residuals. So we have continuity, x momentum, y momentum, z momentum, SDR, which is specific dissipation rate, which is, we will remember, that's our omega. Uh, uh, just let me. Yeah, I guess that's appropriate right now. Um, which is uh, our omega. Sorry. And. Um, that's our omega and uh, TKE, which was our K, is turbulent kinetic energy. And there's also another line, which is CFL. That was a parameter that I just discussed before uh, we went into the break. CFL is another number and it's called Courant Friedrichs Levy number. I'm giving you an unscientific explanation for that. That's not entirely true and uh, don't ever quote me in that way. It's think of it as uh, you are shoving uh, your air f at in at the in, in in the inlet. And with every iteration you are pushing that solution that magically appears from front to the end further through the simulation okay so iteration one solution is here iteration two solution is a step further and then it goes it goes it goes and cfl 
could be seen as kind of the number of cells or something, the amount of space that we push our solution through. So, meaning, that's not a time step, but, but you could think of that like a pseudo time step, a fake time step. We don't have time steps here because we're not steady, we are steady, time invariant. But still, we are pushing the solution through, and the faster we are rushing through, the faster we are getting to a point where we could call it end, because nothing changes anymore. Yeah, remember we are we are uh, we are simulating averages of our flow field uh, criteria in every cell, and their deviation. Their statistical deviation over time, over space, and whatsoever. And when they don't change anymore, that's convergence. And when you push faster through, you might a come faster to the end. Or you could be <laughs> just be too fast that you don't converge at all. Like rushing over. <laughs> At any, at any intersection where you got to turn right, you're just rushing over because you're way too fast and you're not, you're missing your exit and uh, there's no solution because you're literally just unstable. Your step size is too big. Well, it's not exactly like that, but you could think about it like that. Okay? Uh, now my scientific career is uh, beyond repair, I guess. Um... Okay, I have also listed that here, because at some point you can even see, yeah, they take it back and then it rises up again, and sometimes that's even correlated to some bumps and things and whatever happens here. So, reducing the CFL for a, a second, uh, for some iterations, might let some quantities converge better, and other, conver other quantities to converge f slower. See? But uh, don't get me wrong, this is a logarithmic diagram. Yeah, and this is good convergence. See, I started at 1, because it's normalized, and all my residuals are below 104, most at 105, or even 108. Minus 108. 1, minus 08. So, never mind. Uh, okay. That's just something uh, you could look at uh, and determine, okay, that's convergence within 1,000 steps. The um, best practice said, uh, better do 3,000 steps to, uh, to be sure that you reach convergence. Well, that's like three times the runtime. This was eight hours, the other one would be 24. Well, I guess I saved something. So, that's residuals. You always that diagram. Get that diagram. But the most thing that you will create is reports. Um, the first report that I created was like, okay, uh, give me the frontal area. So, I said, okay, do me a... Oops, sorry. Yeah, we need to wait for a second because... What has been seen before uh, could be loaded without loading the full simulation into the memory, but now... Ah, no. Hmm. It hasn't yet loaded the full simulation into the memory. So, here we can see what the total frontal area of that half model is. Okay? So, you have the boundaries in here. See, body, wing front, wing rear, under tray, side ports, blah, 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 blah. Here I even had rough tires as a possibility. And then we have that front tire region with rotary and stationary. And rear as well. Cool. Then we have a CL, a coefficient of lift. The parts. Uh, you just create them by right clicking here and saying new report and say force. 
or force coefficient whatever you want to do yeah force then you can get lift okay if you want to have CL so coefficient of lift you enter all the quantities so you need a direction for that coefficient and I said yeah it's minus Z because that's just like I how we treated lift we said okay lift is not yeah we call it lift but still it's like downforce so we have like a coefficient of downforce which is here right like 3.6 that's our downforce coefficient okay whatever um, important to know here that's not only a coefficient of lift why because I will explain to you um, it has a reference velocity here and it is 60 meters per second as you can see it has a, a reference area which is 0.5 meters square meters why well 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 I need something for text some text editor okay interesting don't save come on so normally you'd say something like uh, your force is um, something like rho so 0.5 times rho which is the air density um, times uh, C your coefficient times uh, in this case uh, it's it might be lift times a that's your representative area uh, your respective area times V square okay that's just how you how the physical formula for for aerodynamic forces so um, copying this having that F lift so it's a lift force and now we're just uh, taking this formula and we are cancelling out we're putting the the constants to the other side so what we're doing now is like first of all put this on the lift side okay so we say it's 2 FL divided by Rho so this one is gone here and then we also put that V square on the other side so we only have this left and what is this this could be um, assumed as a, a force normalized by density and velocity so this gives you a number which is independent on yeah but my car gives more downforce because it's faster blah blah stop it um, this is a unit which can compare totally different concepts which car has better downforce independent of speed okay it's ignoring that the coefficient might be a, a bit dependent on lift or whatsoever um, yeah but it is possible to come to uh, say to to um, um, compare totally different designs because for example say design a has a higher lift coefficient than B but it has like despite having 10% more lift coefficient it also has 20% less respective area so the overall lift will be lower it's just like that famous German luxury car that I'm not naming right now but you might know which one they presented that from one year from one model year to the other model year their gigantic big SUV had a 20 per, uh, no no had a 
had a, a CL uh, a CD value, so a drag coefficient better by don't know. It was 0.36 before, and then it was 0.32 or 0.30 something. And they said, well, yes, clever, very good, getting those big SUVs sustainable. But despite reducing that uh, coefficient by 20%, the frontal area, due to model size ra raising, it also increased more than the drag coefficient shrunk. So overall, the drag was higher, effectively. But you can't do this if you don't know the area. So saying, oh, my, my car has this and that coefficient, it's just nonsense without knowing the respective area. Keep that in mind. And that's why we always had like the reference area in 0.5 here. If that's, this was 1, that would be just the same as this formula. Yeah? But we only had the half model. So by doing it with, with 0.5 here, here, we achieved something that's like the CL times A value. We could still call it CL in this document, but never mind. Okay, that's like basic. Next one is not that basic. Okay, so okay, this one is even more basic, which is just like the total downforce in Newton at 16 meters per second at that given speed, which is 299 Newton. Okay? Okay. Then the next one is CL front. CL front is not easy. I guess I need some geometry uh, representation for that. Or anything like that. Just opening that scene for now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we don't have wheels here. Uh, do you need wheels, guys? No, we don't need wheels right now. Ugh, that's a bit hard to see. Let's go for distinguish inputs. And maybe at the wheels as well. Ah, see what I did here? I left out the, the, the rough part. So, here we go. Um, I want to explain the the CL front for those of you who don't know. Um, one thing designing a race car is getting as much downforce as you can. The other thing is is actually maintaining balance. Your vehicle dynamics department will tell you what balance they want to have. People, pull, never mind. You'll deliver it. That's uh, what you want to uh, what you want to bring them. So, how do you determine front axle and rear axle load? Well, what I did basically here is I made a um, made a momentum coefficient. So, right click on reports, say new reports, flow energy, and moment coefficient. It's, it's a moment coefficient. I don't know why they're not calling it torque. I would call it torque. They call it momentum coefficient. Moment, moment coefficient. I'm sorry. And yes, what's that? That's basically sum, summing up all the moments around a point. So I said, if I want to have the, the front load, aerodynamic front load I take up all take all the parts and all the forces that's that are on the volume on the elements yeah and sum them up 
and make the moment coefficient around around that point here okay where the wheel the rear wheel is located so it's basically just having that point and that moment moment around that point okay exactly so and then as a lever or reference radius for that uh, moment coefficient I just take the wheelbase which is 1515 meters yeah moment torque British American sacre bleu I don't know exactly Hannes you are just right <laughs> thank you by the way okay did you get it? Torque or moment around that point and then divi divided by that reference radius and et voila, you get something that's just like the CL front. Do the same thing around the real rear axle. You get a CL rear. Okay? Don't let this confuse you front and rear are nearly 50 50 right now but they are totally different okay now you can see where the axis is located okay next one the next one is um, ventilation torque see when it comes to drag the the body does not only have like linear drag against the wind but what also happens is the wheels shovel their way through the air and they push via rotation something away from the air but if you just sum it up in x direction you will just cancel out the upper part from the lower part of the wheel like that yeah just cancels out because the one is in the that direction, the other one is in the, the opposite direction, plus minus zero. Here we go. The thing is, it is actually not zero. Because that torque that is necessary to overcome that re air resistance within the wheel and from the wheel outside, because the flat tire surface outside is also shoveling air against the rotation normal rotation rate that's another thing you need to bear in mind and that's most likely ignored in every single simulation and, and it's extremely hard to determine in a wind tunnel as well but in this simulation we got it because I just said okay it's an auxiliary right here Give me the, I said here, come on, new flow. Give me the moment. Yeah. And then I said, okay, put uh, the wheels in there. Yeah, put the wheels in there. Put these parts from the front uh, wheel section in there. Yeah. Okay, and then give me the torque. What I then did is I divided that torque by the tire radius to get a force. That's literally just uh, referring to that point below. And then I'm adding that up into my drag, including moment. Yeah? Yeah, of course, I need to, to have the correct sign here, but then I can say, um, wait, well, 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 where was it? Drag total is 134 newtons, and drag including moment is 135 incomplete, incomplete computing. <laughs> yeah, something is, is not entirely correct here. Something is wrong in my simulation, obviously, but there is 
around 5 to 7 percent from what I found out might be more might be less between that normal drag without the ventilation and with the ventilation or was it yeah here it is like 2% but it can differ okay that's like something you should also bear in mind okay and then I brought it back to to uh, to this downfall and then I calculated back the downforce uh, uh, coefficient uh, the drag coefficient right here because yeah then you need to manually calculate that uh, see drag divided by 118 times 2 reference frontal area velocity velocity and then you get it that's it uh, again CD times a but including that moment okay what did I do further? I also did like a drag coefficient of the body, drag coefficient of a uh, lift coefficient of the body and surface area for literally every part that is here. That's also why I have uh, different boundaries because you can only like uh, see that on boundaries, that splitter value. If that all was in one wall boundary, I couldn't see anything. Okay, but now I can. Okay, further, further, further. Mm, yeah, that goes on for the under tray. That goes on for the for the uh, for the side port for the wheels. Yes, and so on. Uh, if you do wind tunnel testing, bear in mind that uh, every aerodynamic effect that occurs on the wheels is not measured, most likely. And if you do these torque springs, that's also the case. Be careful what you measure. Uh, okay, yes, that's like a lot of reports to determine which geometric part has which kind of lift downforce. But that's only valuable, that's only valid in combination with, with each other. You can't say, yeah, my, my front wing makes so much lift and the under tray is shit because uh, it doesn't make any lift. Yeah, it might be because the front wing takes away all of that. And if you look at one profile from the wing, it might even have a negative drag. Like the main profile might almost likely have a negative drag. But this might also be because there is so much air from the second or the third flap that's just like blocked and pushing the main profile virtually forward so it looks from a numerical standpoint as if uh, the some parts of the geometry had like negative drag but then saying okay i just leave out the parts with positive drag and just have the ones with negative guess what the parts left over will no longer have this fake negative drag they will become positive, most likely, because there is no such thing as negative drag. Be careful what you measure. And there's a lot of quality things here, but uh, let's first see the lift coefficients. That's I limited the lift coefficients, and they uh, they only start at uh, at a certain iteration, like 100. And um, I put them all into one diagram. Which is like, yeah, you click on the on this one and say, create monitor and plot or something. You can also say like, uh, make several and say, create monitor and plot. And then it asks you single, multiple, right? Yeah, you can put uh, several of them into one plot if you want to. So this is the lift plot. Yeah, also see, you can't really see that. You can see that there's like no changes going on in the last 500 iterations so you could also say okay <laughs> if I'm really sure I can also cancel that out after like 500 iterations but you can still see that uh, here there's some intercrossing yeah so what else do we have here Yeah, basically the same for lift and uh, for the drag. 
and here is what I what I told you the wheel wheel rear and the wheel front now nah, they don't have negative ah sorry but they could have if they're completely blocked like from the front wing they could have like negative drag which is not true okay and then I have some some computing metrics which is just like the high watermark of uh, CPU type per iteration and uh, uh, physical memory and virtual memory which is kind of like okay I only took like 24 gigabytes do I have a small simulation here with reduced mesh count let's find out yep that's like a small simulation what we're looking at it's just like 7 million cells <laughs> I guess I didn't have time for more so 7 million cells 24 gigabytes of RAM that's just the high watermark okay what else do we have here so that's like a reduced cell count but the message is still the same um, at some point during my setups I took every single quality metric for cells and put them on one diagram and this is just like the bad cells it's a logarithmic diagram it's cell quality that's just one metric there are like eight and you can see how many good cells or bad cells starting here are in the respective areas yeah it's a bit confusing that this is a log scale here so you can't say well air is only slightly more no it's air is the most share but uh, yeah you can take a look at this uh, and see where you have critical parts probably it should, could just uh, get you uh, something yeah um, at some point I even had all these qualities like face validity, cell quality, cell warpage quality, chevron, least squares, schooners, angle and volume change in my diagram. But at some point I just wrote a macro that deleted all the bad cells. So yes, what I still look at, not in this diagram probably. What I still sometimes look at is um, how many, how big is my share of uh, cells in the buffer layer? So wall Y plus between three and th 30. For me, it's three and 30. And at this point, it was like 0.7% uh, or something, 0.7%, 0.8%. Normally I reached levels like 0 0.25, 0 0.3%, which is better. It just says that uh, the turbulence prediction in these regions. Well, yeah, Deathstroke, as I told you, that's not uh, the uh, good simulation. That's uh, just some preview I ran once. Sorry for that. I don't have a solution for that 36 million case, but that's like my standard case. Um. Okay, Deathstroke, please. The mesh settings that I showed you were for the 36 million so cars. That's most likely reliable. <laughs> yes, sir. I hate that, sir. Don't call me, sir, please. So, further, what do I show in my post processing? something like this first of all I switched the color bar in a way that it takes standard colors from the team so the red is the red of the team and the green is the complementary and the blue is just, just makes up the whole uh, wheel thing and this is typically a um, section of it I never have seen that because we just recently in the latest uh, update we uh, improved the line integral convolution which is here it's literally just a vector scene I can show you velocity vector scene a displayer on the y normal 
and yeah, the wall sheet stress is probably not properly working. Yep. Uh, never mind. And with that, you can swipe through the full car. Um, I have these derived parts here. Sorry, need to close that. The derived parts, which are like plain sections, and then you have that that normal section here. And then I wrote a macro that just loops through these and just like makes makes another section every 10 millimeters or so. Yeah, and with that uh, you can then go through like every section and export a picture every 100 millimeters or something. There's something unphysical going on here. I don't like that, but still it's so extremely slow that I can't literally get anything from that from there. So let's go for 400 or something to see some wings. Yes, so actually you can see the flow here, how it goes up, how it goes down, and uh, how fast it accelerates. Uh, the The real value within these uh, pictures might not be that much, because uh, as I told you, that's a course simulation. But still you, here you can see indications that uh, there is like flow, uh, backflow in the, in the diffuser, which shouldn't be there. But I wouldn't rely on these data too, too much. Just to show you what could be done here. Going to 650 for the tire, I guess. Yeah. Seeing the same flow structures within the wheel. Yes, and so on and some really, really big swirl around that uh, rear ring that's just traveling down wash. Yeah. And you can still see that uh, the flow is impeded to the end of the domain, right? So, yeah, it's better to have a bigger domain than, a, uh, than one that's too small, actually. So, another thing that I could really advise you to do is I need to close all of that is to check your geometries before you run it because at some point especially when doing these um, where is it geometries in one three potentially this scene uh, at some points when you're doing this uh, rotation um, and tangential velocities and you get some some uh, yeah, some some simulation that totally diverges and you don't know why and you get error messages and then you just go there and is that no that's not it which one is shown? Is it that one? Yeah. And then you go like, yeah, what's moving? Nah, didn't want to show that. Then you should maybe at some point just troubleshoot mm, how fast your parts are moving. So you just take like, everything you have and put it into a new into a new SCADA scene like that SCADA then you go for parts you take everything that's not uh, that's like wall oh, come on not that one but I want a floor, I want the body, wing, wing, under tray, side pods, wheel, 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 wheel. And then I want rotary stationary. And then I want rotary stationary. Here we go. 
and we select a function and we just say I want to see the you can also use the search function but I want to see the velocity in my lab reference frame in x direction which is i here and now I have just boundaries moving and then I say okay just make it like that uh-huh mm, then I say okay I need 31 and something that's like this and voila I can say see the floor is moving in that direction and with 16.7 meters per second and the lower tire section is also doing the same movement see I can't distinguish the colors at the midpoint the y velocity is zero and at the top point the wheel is going full steam in the other direction the car is not moving and then I can look inside uh, the wheel carrier oh well there's something interesting going on <laughs> yeah that see that's like really really coarse in there yeah that's the drawback of that mesh but you can also look at the rear and see ah here the suspension parts are all white yeah you could also tweak it and say like minus one to plus one see gets even better so you can f really figure out what's rotating in which direction that's just some some troubleshooting you could do okay how much RAM do you need for 36 million cells yeah you would at least rule of the thumb is you would need two gigabytes of RAM for every 1 million cells so that must be 72 for 32 gigabytes of RAM yeah the biggest you could possibly run is 16 million cells so that's that's it I would maybe advise you to um, to look for opportunities like uh, yeah <laughs> it was Black Friday yesterday you can buy RAM and if it fits into your machine just just put it in <laughs> or go for something that's like cloud-based there are providers if you were non-profit you can maybe easily get uh, yeah I only had a laptop at that time I brought that model up to life and I still put in as much RAM as possible yeah, but still, you need to cope with that, uh, uh, with what you, with what you have, yeah. Exact, um, especially when, as we are on the transition from DDR4 to 5 RAM, DDR4 gets cheaper as a used product. Worth a thought, maybe. And yes. That's my advice on the memory at that point. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one, Hannes. That's a good one, Hannes. Um, thank you, everybody. I guess I'm done for now. I could have talked hours on the post-processing. But I guess I will save this for another session. I'm so sorry that we only took like six and a half hours now and not full ten hours or something. So people, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and so people from the US, you might want to watch uh, the, the replay. 
as it's just uh, thank you I think with your questions Deathstroke and all the others Anis thank you you really enriched my afternoon my my day and it was actually fun doing this here in front of you and it might not be the last time you heard of mashed potato <laughs> I th I still hope you like that name I, and uh, yeah just fishing 30 thank you cool if you have further questions just hack them into the chat yeah I'm trying to convince my my management to regularly stream my actual work and not uh, only the things that I that I uh, ah, you're welcome this turning uh, <laughs> Uh, not only what is what has what I have been doing as a student, but also like uh, the si things I actually do for work. Um, you might get a, some impressions on LinkedIn. Yeah, please. Yeah, waste a thought about following me there. Just posting my profile in the chat. Noodle stream simulations. <laughs> Yes, yes. Actually, the noodle was not done by myself, but uh, um, I have a working student. From time to time, I even hire students. So I just recently hired a student, and uh, this was the first simulation she did for our department, which was a noodle, noodle stream. And she's doing more and more and more of that. And it's just fun to see what can be done in CFD. And so follow me on LinkedIn. I am not entirely sure when uh, yeah. Okay. Um if I validate one of my parts, let's say a rear wing properly in a high fi fidelity simulation that I can do on my laptop. I'm not sure if I understand that correctly. Are you talking about simulating parts only? Because that's something I would really, really avoid saying, just simulating a rear wing. That will give you, like, not even a rough number. Well, with that setup, you will get a comparable uh, number. You can basically, for the first time, you can you can just double the the base size and see what happens. See, for that seven millions, I will switch to a 100 millimeters in base size. Um, yes, I think this 36 million cell mesh is is still an approximation. <laughs> to be honest, it's maybe a better one. Uh, at some point you will ignore effects, okay? Think about swirls that come off wing edges, just big swirls. At some point these swirls, for every swirl, for every eddy, you need two or uh, four cells basically, yeah, to have an eddy. And uh, a flow structure smaller than a single cell can't be resolved. At some point you're just ignoring so many flow structures that your results will become meaningless. And the thing is, you don't only look at the numbers, but you also look at the pictures and then say, okay, I see there's a swirl going on from that part of the wing because it's going in that direction and we need to change it in another way. And here's the flow separation and here we don't have fast air and whatsoever, blah, blah, blah. And at some point these interpretations won't be meaningful anymore because you don't have the data for that. And Deathstroke for the very last time. Just say okay and not okay, sir. I was never honored or knighted by the British Empire. I'm not a sir. Okay? I feel old. <laughs> yeah, force of habit happens to the best of us, so... <laughs> okay. Just call me potato, that's okay for now. <laughs> uh, okay. 
Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, then. Like. That's all from my end. I have said all I wanted. I have shown all I wanted. My dog is getting tired of the, me talking way too loud. So I'd say let's call it a day and tune in whenever I'm online next. I will announce it. So f maybe leave a leave a follow or something. You don't need to sub because that's just like useless. <laughs> I'm not making money with this stream and I don't intend to. Yes. Maybe see each other again. Don't know how, don't know which topic, but sure will. So, take care and goodbye.